seen a guy who go up, literally if my sister brought him home, I'd be terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but he- but- Welcome back to the Irish Bear Show. It's great to be back. We're here going into week four. It seems it's flying in already, Adam. It's crazy. It's, it is it's absolutely insane. crazy. It seems like we're only talking about uh, we're nearly at the re- the real games now. Suddenly the real games are here, and we're a month into the season. So, I don't want the real games at this point. I just take them back. Take them back. <laughs> yeah, take them back at this stage. Look, we are. Look, we wanted to get it, get him on to talk a little bit about the New York Giants. Looking through kind of these two teams, Adam as well, is they're very similar to each other. <laughs> a lot of people in the national stage did not expect much from either team. We were, I don't know about you guys, but we were told that we are the worst team. We have the worst offensive line, the worst defense going into this year. And yet somehow we, we stand here 2-1. and one. And similarly, it's probably been said about the Giants and be the worst team in the division and yet you guys started two and one so what's it been like the first three weeks of the season for you guys uh it's been a a lot of emotions i think because i think the giants similar to the bears not a lot of expectations coming into the year um a lot of turnover in the front office new gm new head coach um and a lot of you know giant fans were just looking for competency i think that's the one thing that they've lacked over the last five six years is they haven't been a competent organization top to bottom from decision making, from coaching hires, from you know the way they put together their roster. Just hasn't been any direction. And finally, it just seems like there's glimpses of that. There's a path forward. There's a plan forward. And I think that's what's given them hope. And then on the field, you know, they find because they have the right process, they're getting the right results. And that's why they started two and zero. And I think you know Monday night was sort of a reality check for a lot of fans. Just to tell them, like, hey, it's still a rebuild. This roster still has a lot of work to do. Um, but overall, you know, it's been a lot of positive vibes. Yeah, absolutely. And Adam, just listening to him say that, it's very similar to what we've been going through. Well, I feel right. like we know you. I feel like we've been yeah. on the same show for a, a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think the Bears and the Giants are sort of similar, right? Like, yeah. if you ask a Giant fan what's been the problem, they'll say, you know, our ownership hasn't done a really good job. If you ask a Bears friend that, they'll say the same thing. Um, we have both have uncertainty at quarterback. I don't know how you guys feel about Justin Fields, but I think it's incomplete right now. We're still, still wait and see mode. I think whereas the Giants, they sort of have a little bit more clarity about who Daniel Jones is. It's just sort of that final, you know, last chance, if you want to call it. Yeah, yeah it's, so, it's interesting. Sorry, Karen, about that ahead. is, you know, you talk about the, a little more clarity on Danny jo- Daniel Jones and – you kind of look at the situations and it's very parallel. You know, this is Danny Dimes fourth year in the offense. And we just got through that with Trubisky where we had to cut bait on that first rounder because he wasn't what we thought. And, you know, you you look at the numbers, you kind of mentioned it here on this year where it's two really effective running teams with two really ineffective run defenses. So it's like looking in a mirror with this, you know, this show preview, because you kind of look at the situations and you look at where you guys are kind of experiencing what we had last year, where it's like, all right, dude, this is your fourth year. If this is it, and then you bring in Dayball, who I was all aboard the Dayball train uh, when we were doing the coaching search. I really wanted him. I like, you know, what he's done, the places he's been, you know, experience after us having a coach who hasn't been anywhere. So, you know, they they talked a lot about his uh, his handling of Daniel Jones, which I really like that he's not afraid to tell him when he messes up and hold him accountable. And they said that's what Danny's needed to see if he's got it. So it's really interesting kind of watching you guys go what we went through because ours was catastrophic last year. Um, but I, I like the fact that yeah. you've got Dable in the room kind of steering that ship in the make it or break it year for, you know, your your first round quarterback. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really not just like make or break. I think at this point it's like, it's more so like, Hey, this is the situation. It's a new regime. We looked at the draft. We don't think that there's a franchise caliber quarterback in the draft. We did have two first round picks thanks to Chicago. Um, You're welcome. And there wasn't, there wasn't like an option there where we could say, okay, let's go get this quarterback. And a lot of the right. veteran quarterback movement, the Giants roster wasn't set up that way to take on a Russell Wilson or somebody like that. It's just a, a tear it down and rebuild. And with Daniel Jones, it's like we just have to have him for the last year because there's no other reliable option out there that we can bring in that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that we have all these conversations going into the season. Again, we're trying to, when you're dealing with the team on an individual basis and you're looking at the team 24 seven, what was your expectations for the Giants? Because for a lot of outside, maybe fans from other teams, they saw what happened last year. They saw obviously Saquon didn't have the success a bit injured last year as well. And then suddenly he comes back and he looks like the Saquon we saw from two years ago. And Mm -hmm. you're, we know what Daniel Jones is at this point, but also the defense this year looks a, a lot better than it has before. And that's coming down to the staff because there's not a whole load of new players because obviously Kayvon Thibodeau got, got injured from that dirty play in the preseason. Um, but then, but it's a, that's where we're saying there's similarities for us here as well because in terms of Chicago, the, the defense is essentially the same except for they've ripped away kind of guys that were injured last year in kind of Khalil Mack and you saw Akeem Hicks and guys that left and to try and rebuild it and other than kind of the run defense like the rest of it has worked out pretty pretty well so what's been your I guess what was your initial thoughts going into this season for the Giants did it mirror what people were saying about the team or was it vastly different well, I think, you know, coming into it, um, if you ask majority of Giant fans, majority of people that cover the team uh, on, a, on a local level, it really was like, hey, this season is just all about, you know, 90 guys to start training camp of 53 guys really auditioning to be on a roster next year, whether that's with the Giants or with somewhere else. Um, particularly on the defense, they didn't have a lot of talent. They got rid of, not got rid of, they, they wanted to move James Bradbury for salary cap reasons. And I think that was another big issue with the Giants is their salary cap situation was really, really bad. And it really made them difficult. It really made things difficult for Joe Shane to really try to bring in some sort of talent. And that's why they had to part ways with James Bradbury, who's probably either, if not their first or second best defensive player last year. And it created a gaping hole at cornerback. And, you know, coming into it, they're playing a lot of young guys, a lot of rookies, a lot of second year guys. I think the way I described it is there's, you know, about two or three, you know, maybe maybe four established players starting on this defense. But the majority of them are young and experienced guys who are sort of looking for a role. Are they going to be a long-term starter at this position? Are they going to be somebody that's just a one-year guy? And because, because of the way their roster is and how depleted it is of talent and depth, for them to come out and be that, you know, play particularly well defensively, I think – You know, against Dallas, they gave up a lot of yards on the ground, but, you know, they still held them to 20 points. And I think if you look at the first two weeks against Tennessee and against Carolina, what they've been able to do in stopping the stopping Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry, who are two game changing running backs. I think that's that echoes sort of like the confidence that I I spoke about earlier with the confidence in the coaching staff when they're able to execute a game plan, knowing that they're going into a game where they're probably going to be, you know, going up against the roster that has better better talent. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it seems very similar when we, we kind of look at it for, from the bears perspective. And then we look at when you want to look at the strengths of these two teams at the start of the season, it's all come from the running game, right? Saquon has looked really, really good. And then for the bears has been in week two was, David Montgomery and then Montgomery goes down and Khalil Herbert Mm -hmm. looks like a different animal last week. So look, I I just want to ask you to kind of speak about, first of all, the Giants rushing attack in general this season and then the run defense and what that is looking like early on in the season. Well, I think in terms of their run defense, um, they have a really strong interior with Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence. Now, Leonard Williams missed his first career game last week. I think he sprained his MCL against the Carolina Panthers. We'll see if he's able to play Sunday. But without him, 
Uh, it sort of exposes their weaknesses at the second level with the linebackers. Um, so a lot of the Dallas's runs, they were able to get to the outside. There were gaping holes. Uh, but for the first two weeks, their run defense was, was pretty stout. They did give up some yards, but overall, they didn't let Derrick Henry beat them. They didn't let uh, Christian McCaffrey beat them. Uh, in terms of running the football, I think the, the biggest improvement for the Giants outside of Saquon Barkley getting healthy, uh, you know, he, he's the ACL injury in 2020 and then coming back in 2021, just as he started to get going, uh, he suffered a high ankle sprain against the Cowboys and that sort of derailed his season. But then this year with them sort of investing in the offensive line, drafting Evan Neal, bringing in Mark Lewinsky, it's still a, a an offensive line that's under construction. Uh, and Giant fans don't want to hear that because they, they the offensive line has been under construction for a decade now. Um, but they've made investments. And I think Andrew Thomas has established himself as a really premier elite left tackle in this league. Um, and the, the hope is Evan Neal can be that one uh, one day as well. Um, but they've from their strength on offense, you talk about running the football, it's because those five guys that are starting, all their all five of their strengths is run blocking. I think that's been the big thing. And then obviously having a healthy Saquon Barkley helps too. Adam, again, it's just <laughs> it's so similar when we look at these teams because that's I mean, what we've been talking. they're both in similar spots. Both organizations yeah. are very similar where they are right now. Yeah, because we've been saying that over like the the last couple of weeks in terms of in terms of both run block and this this offensive line have been really really good to start the season. I think they have had multiple players ranked in kind of the top ten in terms of the I guess the grades that are going out by different websites and stuff like that. But then you have a, a team that when you look at the tape that well, there's passing plays not being made. Fields has had plenty of room out there to to be able to operate. And like you said, Thomas at left tackle has been really good for the Giants. And then I know a lot of people are kind of harping on, on, on Neil the last couple of weeks. And Adam, I want to bring that to, to you because that, and I, I think I tweeted this out and the fact that it's not easy for tackles that are rookies coming in. We've seen Nick Wanu as well for the Carolina Panthers. It's been really tough and how great that must feel for a Bears fan to get your left tackle in the fifth round and nobody has to talk about them because they're not making catastrophic errors that everybody is highlighting on tape. And I always say, for especially when it comes to pass blocking, I don't want to hear about my offensive line. <laughs> I want to make sure that right. nobody knows what they are doing because they're just doing their job. So, Adam, with all the talk around some of these rookie tackles, because that's been... I guess the talk of this weekend because there's a couple of kind of botched plays from a couple of them that went in the first round. What's your kind of confidence level looking at Braxton Jones coming in as that kind of fifth rounder, not caring where he was drafted and just being a productive player early in the season? Well, and this, this kind of goes back to what we talked about a lot in the, the off season that, you know, draft position and draft pedigree always matters to us to a point. But also now it's just about talent. I mean, with the the depth of information and video and everything available, it's not as hard to find guys in later rounds. So you look at, you know, Braxton and talk about how we haven't heard his name much. It was what one of his first plays against Bosa that they highlighted him getting bull rushed and he looked like a child on the football field. Yeah. But we've seen him grow from that. And that's expected. We talk about it all the time with young players. So when you bring up like Evan Neal, I'm not too, you know, too worried about it. He's going to hit those growing pains. And he's in an offense where people know what he's going to do. And we see that again. You, you talk about the parallels here where sometimes things are going to get exploited because defenses know what you're going to do. And you saw in the second half of the Bears game last week, teams weren't biting on the play action as much because they really weren't worried about the Bears beating them through the air and, and forcing then the offensive line to adjust to that and not be able to do what they were. So you look at a guy like Neil where, you know, he's he's looked good for a majority of his career. I don't think he just forgot how to play it. It's just one of those things where it's growing pains early in the season. He's got a new offensive coach with some great ideas. He's learning a lot as he goes, and that goes for most of the rookies. So, you know, hopefully this isn't the game where he puts it all together um, selfishly. <laughs> Obviously for you, Weiss, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping otherwise. But, you know, for us, you know, you hope that this is the game where he still hits some of those growing pains so our defense can get a little bit of their confidence going. But, um, you know, same with most of those guys. You know, Braxton Jones is going to hit a wall at some point and teams are going to yeah. start picking up tend tendencies on him. And it's going to be, you know, how can he adjust? And then maybe that's where some of the limitations as a later round pick might come into play. But that's just the ebb and flow of being a young guy. You know, we talk about Justin Fields. He's still a baby in football years. 
So, you know, he's got the the three games and what, 10 starts last year. So he's not even at a full season. And we're seeing that full, you know, full circle right now. So um, it's always interesting. It's fun to watch. But I do love the overreactions. One of my favorite things to do, Weiss, is call out overreactions on this show. You know, you see one bad game or one bad play and it's like, oh, Braxton, uh, Braxton can't stop the bull rush. He's terrible. And then the rest of the game, you don't hear his name. And it's like, just let it play out. Just see what happens. This game is going to be two teams who are essentially fully rebuilding and re, 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 relearning their identity. The Dable offense, yeah. the 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 Getze offense. There's going to be a lot of runs. There's going to be not a lot of passing, very likely. Um, if there is, it's I'd be Ar- very it's surprised. Army Navy. I, that, that's what I told somebody. <laughs> exactly. <Army> exactly. <laughs> and you know, some get. Let's see a, a ton of run options and. Um, but it, it, it's it's going to be one of those games where you're still seeing those guys learn, those young offensive linemen in a game like this. It's going to be some smash mouth football. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it is fun to watch. You know, th- this game is going to be two bad teams. One team's going to look good, and someone's going to overreact to that. <laughs> yeah, I think honestly, the big thing, I... <laughs> with, uh, just to harp on what you're saying with the offensive linemen, and, and, and Giant fans sort of got this because Andrew Thomas was really bad his first year. He really struggled a lot, but he got better as the season went along. And I, and I told somebody this earlier earlier in the week uh, when we were talking about Evan Neal's performance. I said, you really got to look at uh, an offensive tackle's first year the same way you look at a quarterback's first year. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be times where you're like, does this guy know how to play football? But the most important thing is he continues to develop. And I think because Giant fans saw that firsthand with Andrew Thomas, who just improved steadily as the weeks went along, as the season went on, um, that gives them confidence that Evan Neal will – He'll settle down and he'll establish himself as, you know, as the right tackle of the future for the Giants. Yeah, it's the one thing that I always try and tell people as well. And look, Adam, we we said this on the third day in the draft when it seemed like the Bears were taking like ten offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. We're like, it's really hard to to know what guys are going to be so early on in their NFL career because the way offensive line is taught in college football is completely different to the way it's taught in mm-hmm. at the NFL level. So it does take time. Sometimes you get guys that come in and the way it's coached at the NFL level suits the way they want to play. And that's where you see some guys like Braxton Jones, who was a fifth round pick where whatever was happening in college didn't suit the way he was playing in games. And suddenly comes to a team where he kind of vibes with the coach and he just takes it all on board and is able to start. There's other guys that, our first round picks that have done excellent in college football that need that adjustment period. You mentioned it yourself there, Wise, with with Andrew Thomas. Like he was a really good prospect coming out. Same thing for Evan Neal. And look, I think a lot of a lot of teams would be happy to have those two prospects on the offensive line. We kind of went into the season with every single person saying that the Bears offensive line was going to be one of the worst in football. Well, we kind of looked at it and we're like, if a couple of things click here, that's just not going to be the case. A couple of things have clicked on the offensive line, and it's definitely not the case because they're one of the best run, I guess, run blocking in, in the league right now. And it's still one of those where there's been rotations on the line. So it's definitely positive going into it. But look, there we've mentioned kind of the running. Things are going to be very, very good. It'll be really which team can stop it more. Um, but it comes to then can either team circumvent that with a little bit of passing and yeah. for the Bears, it's been all over the place to start the season. For you guys, it's been a little bit better, but then obviously... No, it's been all, <laughs> it's been all over yeah. the place for us, too. Well, look, at least you guys have two receivers that are above 100 yards. We don't have that yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, the, but the thing is, one of the, I guess, the top um, guy with the most receiving yards has now gone down with an ACL injury in Sterling Shepard. So... What's it looking like for, for the Giants coming in? Obviously, it seems like the coaching staff just – they don't really like Kenny Galladay right now, and they're trying to I get mean, some of the younger guys in either. So what's, what, what is your confidence level going through the season? You mentioned some, some guys need a little bit of time to develop. Do you, do you think that there's anybody in this kind of Giants passing attack that you could see as the season going on could develop into at least somebody that you would consider keeping – longer term for when you actually do want to kind of get better players in those positions i think i mean absolutely i think you look at Kadarius tony uh who's the first round pick last year um it's been a really tough start to his career a lot of injuries uh, a lot of disconnect between him and the new coaching staff a lack of trust 
Uh, so as he's trying to build that trust up with the Giants, this new giant regime, you know, he unfortunately goes down with a hamstring injury and that sort of derails that. He's working himself back from that. Even when he was healthy to start the season, he played two snaps against the Titans in week one and week two. I think he played like 20, 24. But, you know, they haven't really, you know, he's he's probably their, actually he is their most talented receiver. But again, there's just something missing there between him and the new and the new coaching staff. And Kenny Galladay, I mean, it's it's a combination of things. You know, it's 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 basically being broken up with your ex-girlfriend, but you can't move out. I mean, the Giants would have tried to do everything they can to move him. If they could cut him, they could, but because of the way the contract is set up, they just don't have the cap space to eat the dead money right now. Um, and like I said, nobody's trading for his contract. Uh, there, he talked about not getting enough snaps. He got the snaps, dropped a big third down pass, uh, just ha- isn't able to get any separation. It just doesn't seem like his role is going to increase uh, even with Sterling Shepard going down. I think the wild card here is Darius Slayton. Uh, the fifth round pick was taken, you know, I think in 2019, had a very good start to his career, really good r- rookie season, um, has struggled since then, but he's still been a contributor. And I think this year, you know, it didn't seem like he was going to make the 53-man roster, but they sort of reconstructed his ro- his final year of his deal and he was able to stay. I think he's a guy that can take a top off of defense. He does have chemistry with Daniel Jones. Uh, he could potentially step up and, and sort of fill that role and take the top off the defense. Wandale Robinson, who they took in the second round this past offseason, a guy that, similar to Tony, you want to just get the ball in his hands. He can do a lot of things, make people miss. Um, so they do have, like, talent. The problem is Kadarius Tony just nobody knows what he can do because, they, like I said, the injury and all that. Um, and then Wandale Robinson, the second-round pick, rookie, we just spoke about rookies, you know, with with the offensive line. They got to get him on the field. He was injured in week one. Um, both guys were sort of marked as did not practice today, even though it was a walkthrough. So we'll see for Sunday if they can get one, if not two. But yeah, there, there is some talent there. I just think it's a matter of you know if these guys can stay healthy and get on the field. Yeah, absolutely. And again, Adam, if we mentioned a couple of times today, there's a lot of similarities between kind of that sense with with the bears as well there's guys that have talent there but it's just not clicking on offense obviously you have byron pringle going down and going on ir for at least out for the next four to five weeks and maybe valus jones jr comes back for this game maybe it's kind of another week or two vikings game or the commander's game bears are in a, a tough situation in terms of the passing attack as well even just in terms of the weapons we're not really sure what to expect adam do you what do you guys think about darnell mooney is is darnell mooney like a wide receiver one i've heard so many mixed things about him i don't i don't know what to can what is what is he whether we think so or not he's our wr1 so (laughs) So, i i I think he has i think he has the talent i mean look at what he's done in the the last couple years with the naggy system with you know trubisky throwing to him and everything i think he's got the the talent and potential to flourish as a top end receiver. But I don't think that right now he's displaying any of that. And for all the truthers who are, you know, no matter what, he's a WR one. Cause what we've seen, I think this year is kind of showing the other side of that coin of like, yeah, he did it in a bad offense, but also there's no offense right now. There is no passing game. He's only had a, a less than a handful of targets. I think we're heading into week four without 300 total passing yards. So it's one of those things where there hasn't really been a case made for him to even, you know, wide receiver four on any teams this year. Um, but I, I do I do think it's there just based on what we've seen in the past when things are really bad. And it, it I, that kind of extends to Komet, too, who was equally, uh, you know, on equal footing with Mooney this year. Those were supposed to be the two dudes who, when Justin needed somebody, those were the guys. And, you know, he he put up good receiving numbers with no touchdowns last year. And that's another one where, you know, if the offense scored touchdowns in general last year, I believe he would have had more. But, you know, both guys this year have been completely absent. So anyone who does have that argument, they they genuinely need to be able to, to, to defend their stance because there is zero game tape from this year where you can be like, see, this this year in this supposed offensive system, this is what he can do. So I think it's there, but I, we definitely haven't seen it since that whole, you know, argument, debate, whatever has started. Yeah, it's kind of like we all be, we kind of believe that based on past performance but then you look it into this particular offense and he hasn't done anything uh, like 
the thing is you can't go out there and say yes he's a he's a wide receiver one because when things go wrong you expect your number one right wide receiver to still step up and that's where i think his he's a talented receiver but it's like a 1a 1b that without somebody else there it's it's difficult he's gonna he's i think he's always gonna be a productive wide receiver i don't know if he's gonna be one of those dominating wide receivers that a lot of these teams are now looking for because of how important they are with modern day offenses and i think that's i think that's the main difference i think look in whatever it is a year or so darno mooney's gonna get paid a very handsome contract from either the bears or somebody else because he's produced in his first couple of seasons and look i think eventually i still think he probably hits a thousand yards this year anyway um it just depends on how quick the offense can get their act together because it's just like fields was better last year under Nagy, and that offense was terrible so i think at some point this year they'll see a turnaround is it just because it's a it's a new offense it's there's a lot of complexities in there is it just going to take time probably there's a lot of new faces in there as well so i think what the bears have done is they try to stick to what they're good at and stick to the run game and then at some point in time they need to just have a a balanced passing attack i think if they do that then you'll probably see some of those guys be pretty successful um this year but look guys before i let you go um i wanted to ask you in terms of a giant's perspective what are the giants keys to try and win this football game for this weekend uh, run the ball, try to get something in the passing game, and then defensively, you know, stop the run and make Justin Fields throw the ball. I think, you know, Wink Martindale, their defensive coordinator, the one thing he'll do is he's going to blitz and he's going to bring, bring pressure every opportunity he gets. And uh, if he's able to do that and the Giants can get, you know, get home to the quarterback, I do think the Giants can pull this out. The game is going to be a close one. I think, it, you know, I think the Bears, they look, they look pretty competent when you watch them. They're not – you know, both teams are sort of similar in, you know, where they are in their stage of their rebuild. But I uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a good game. You know, if you're, yeah. if you're somebody that likes close football, I think it's going to be that. Yeah, I think where the Giants and the Bears are similar, where a lot of people say they're not very good football teams, they're competitive football teams. They're never going to get blown out by kind of your your average teams, which is pretty much the majority of the teams in the NFL. There's about five <laughs> good ones. And they're going to be competitive. They're not going to be one of those teams that looks terrible on a week-to-week basis because they have good coaching right now. And look, yeah. I think that's that's the interesting thing. And that's why I do think it's going to be an interesting game. While I don't think the passing attacks are going to yield loads in this game, I think the rushing attacks probably do. So there's still going to be a lot of offense there. <clears throat> Just in kind of old-fashioned like 80s or 90s football rather than in the current kind of generation. Well, well, the, the difference is the Bears don't throw the ball. The Giants throw the ball. They just don't have success because their receivers yeah. can't get the ball. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So if uh, if you're a Bears DB, you got to be happy going into this game. Like, yeah. look, that's good. And Adam, as you know, all we need is Eddie Jackson to get an interception and we're going to win the game because it's 12-0 and 0 right now. <laughs> okay, wow. We need that T in the hits principle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But look, Wes, we really appreciate you uh, joining us. Do you want to let anybody know where they can kind of see some of your content? Yeah, just follow me, NYG Daily, man. If you're a Bears fan, you want to talk shit on Sunday, hit me up. You know, <laughs> I had Cowboy fans. I had a Cowboy guest on last week, and he got all of his good people to come at me. So, hey, if you're going to follow me for one week, just make it the Bears week. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Wes, we're, we really appreciate you coming on and joining us today. Thanks. Perfect. All right. So with that, we actually have another guest with us who I did not think he was actually going to make it to on the show today. Um, but amazingly, he has. And his name is Anthony. Hey! <laughs> how are we doing, my friend? I finally realized how to drive from one part of Ireland to the other. It's fantastic. How are we all <laughs> doing in uh, both Dublin and Chicago? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Doing good. I feel positive vibes going in here. I've enjoyed the first 29 minutes of the show, getting a bit of Giants talk out of the way, learning a little bit about the opposition team, realizing they're basically a carbon copy of the Bears right now. Um, but yeah, look, it's it's good. Um, coming into this weekend, look, Anthony, we haven't had you on for, I think, was it maybe two weeks now or a week and a half or so? A week and a half. Poor, yeah. Adam, poor Adam had to listen to me after after Packers week when it was like five o'clock in the morning. So poor Adam had to put up with me. Had, then. 
He had to sleep it off for a, a week and I've a half. Been dense ever since, right? So, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, look, look, I'm I'm one of those weird people that enjoys Bears wins. Um, I fully I fully appreciate that um, we're not perfect. We're not where we should be in the passing game, but I enjoy some of the stuff that I'm seeing. I, I must admit, I enjoy a lot of what I saw on Sunday. In in the in the fact of that. Roquan kicked back in, and you guys have spoken about this a lot. Roquan kicked back in, and our running game looked good, and our O line looked good, and and uh, everyone seems to be focusing on what we didn't do well instead of necessarily what we did do well. I also think, and it's not being co- talked about a lot, Texans Texans have a very good coach, and um, they may not have a very good team, but they have a very good coach, and I think they they'll they'll annoy teams in the NFL um, and and get and get a lot out of that. So yeah, look, we're two and one going two and one going to New York. This is the one game of the top of the first four that I really, really, really can't call. Um, I think you've said it right there when I was listening to you guys that this is two teams that are very, very similar in a lot of ways. Um, but they've got Saquon Barkley, which is a sensational running back, and we've got hopefully Herbert that's going to do the exact same thing. So I'm uh, I'm intrigued as I always am because there's only 17 of these Bears games. We're on to number four. Soon enough, we'll be over in Chicago to enjoy number six. Or, yeah, six. Yeah, six. It is week six that all of us will be over there. We'll be having fun. And from I know Anthony arrives on the Monday. The rest of us arrive on the Wednesday. It's going to be a lot of fun for the days that we are there, especially during game day on Thursday night football against the Washington Commanders. So if you are listening to this and you are going to that game, if you see us, make sure you say hello. We, uh, we always enjoy kind of meeting bear signs even in random places and we've said it before anthony's gone traveling in sweden in the airport has met met bears fans i've met like there's a i have two bears fans that actually live on my road and i didn't even know that and i didn't even know that so it's good there's a, two bears fans on my road and there's a packers fan on my road and like most people here you wouldn't see it that very often so it's a yeah, it's good. It's good. Can't complain. But look, all my neighbors are embarrassed to be Bears fans, but I have a Saints fan across the street. So, you know, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. But look, yeah, I, I do want to talk about before we get Clay Harbor on, which he'll be joining us in about 28 minutes. And when he's on, we're going to basically talk about the game coming up here. And we do want to preview a lot of it. But because, Anthony, you haven't been on the show and you have been kind of outright in how you've spoken about the game that had just happened. And I think this is where we, when we did our five things video on Monday or yeah, Monday, I think that really helped because it gave you kind of like 24 hours to go back and think about kind of the important parts of it. And point five for us, look, we spoke about all the negatives, the positives. So guys, if you haven't checked it out, please do check that out. But number five, I thought was the most important and it was, Winning matters. Yeah. At the end of the day, we can say, and look, if Justin Fields proves that he's not the guy this year, okay, he proves he's not the guy this year. But I'd rather know that and also know that you have a football coach that even when things aren't going your way, you can still win football games. Like at the end of the day, you can say, okay, it's going to affect your draft position. But look, in the best, in the best case scenario, Justin Fields develops and you don't have to go and try and get a quarterback in the draft. So that's not what you want. You want to make sure that the guy you currently have in there is the guy and you feel confidence that you can build on him and build in this offense. But you're right, Anthony, the amount of people like it's, what is it now? Three days on from the game. Like, come on, go move to the next week, right? Okay. Justin sucked at the weekend. Let's try and make sure that he doesn't, he doesn't suck next week and just keep building on him. And instead of trying to like, say this team is terrible but I'm like we're two and one like it could be so much worse like it could be oh and three and we could be if we're oh and three and people are talking like this i'm like okay cool yeah you, that's right we've lost every single game well that's not the case we've won two out of we've won two out of three but there's only 17 of these i, I don't i don't get okay, okay i've always said it, i'm always saying on twitter be whatever type of fan you want to be. You want to be the press fan. You enjoy doing that. You enjoy pissing on your team. You enjoy not, in, not enjoying that. That's completely fine. That's completely up to you. That's your call. You do whatever, what makes you comfortable. But for me, why waste that energy? What What's the point? This should be fun. Being a supporter, being a fan should be fun. And look, 
100% you're watching the game last Sunday and you get frustrated because Justin was making errors and you've built this guy up and you think this is the guy. He still probably will be. He's got 13 games. We're not talking about year three or year four, like what the what the Giants are doing with their quarterback. We've got a situation right now where Justin needs to be developed. And we've also got to remember that their first team coaches, our first year coaches in there who are probably making wrong calls. But at the end of the day, Ryan Poles and their flus don't really care outside of winning football games. Do you see how excited they were at the end of the game when they won? What, if Justin if Justin balls out and we lose a 40-point to 38 cracker, do you think Iberfus is going to be like, yeah, that's fantastic, brilliant? No, because his record... I think they feel a lot better about next year if he balls out in a blowout game like that, though. I think there's a balance. I think that's the important Correct. part. You can be happy and still think that Fields played like ass. And that goes back to the Packers game where it's like, yeah, there were some good things, but there were some bad things. And people, there's, it's so black and white. There's no gray area. And people need to start acknowledging that we can be ecstatic that we're two and one because we said during the schedule show, it's a soft start to the schedule. It's a great opportunity for a young team with minimal experience to go out there and win some games before you go face Buffalo and Miami and the Eagles and everything else. And it's going to be tough for a while. So like to your point, Ant, and I, I don't mean to cut you off in that, but to your point, like, it's great to get out here and get on this run because while the quarterback is struggling, we can look at the fact that the team's not giving up and they're picking him up and they're having his back. And my worry is when we start, you know, facing those higher end teams a couple games in a row, what are people going to say? But they have to understand too that this is a development year. Whether we're winning or not, this team isn't built to win the goddamn Super Bowl. Yep. So when people are sitting here going, well, if we're five and one by game six and Justin Fields sucks, we need to bench him for Trevor Simeon. Shut the hell up because this is still a development year for Justin Fields. We're going to win games. We're going to enjoy it. If he plays bad, it's the first indicator in this guy's entire life that he might have some bad tendencies that are lasting more than a game or two. It's the first time he's had these struggles. Like that's what people need to understand that it's, it's tough. It's tough to see him struggle, but also it's great to see this team win. And we've lost so much the last couple of years. Enjoy it while we grow, because at the end of this year, we're not making the playoffs. We're not winning the Super Bowl. We're not doing any of that. So you know what? There's going to be growing pains. Enjoy what we can enjoy because there's going to be a lot more we don't enjoy in the grand scheme of the season. And that's what pisses me off is the people who say that it's already done. There's nothing left to enjoy because Justin Fields threw two bad interceptions against a Houston Texans team that nobody respects. It's like, who cares? Who cares? That's one game in week three. And we've got 14 more of these bad boys coming up. Who the hell knows what's going to happen? That's what's fun about it. And that's what people refuse to acknowledge is the mystery of it all. What's going to happen? I don't know. I love it. But the best part about that is if we go, Tony, my man. It's, it's even that is the best part. You're right. It's Tony heard me ranting and he's like, yeah, let's go. Let's go. I felt that was my, that was my audition, that was my audition for you guys. If Justin, if, if Justin balls out on Sunday, right? Those same guys you say were shit and say that that were that he's a bust and all this were, were all terrible. I'm going to be talking about him being. I, the I always sport. knew he had it in him. He always had yeah. it in him. And it's like it's just it's Jekyll and Hyde. It's. It's basically fandom on crack. But they don't, don't do it for news. Journalism isn't news anymore. It's all done for reactions. That's the whole thing. We give those people way too much attention. And you know what? If they want people gog gobbling on their junk because they have a hot take that makes absolutely no sense, we shouldn't be the ones gobbling because you know what? It doesn't taste good. I don't want that medicine because if you're going to change your opinion every goddamn week based on what happens, then that's not news. And people are treating it as news. And that's where the black and white thing comes because they see someone's opinion and they go, that's it. That's the fact. And it's not a fact. It's usually just someone's shitty opinion because they want clicks. They want to be viral. They want to get retweeted and have their, their handle on whatever, not ESPN because ESPN sucks unless you like LeBron James. But that's that's what it is, is the stuff that people are consuming now, they're just consuming things that there's no checking. There's no nothing. It just goes out there. And if people like it, you get the confirmation bias of everybody in the world now thinks Justin Field sucks because a thousand people retweeted one tweet of a bad play that's misconstrued or taken out of context. And that's the problem is everything snippets, everything's so small that nobody actually looks at what they're looking at. And then people digest it as if it's news. And I completely agree with a lot of that as well, because the only thing I got from that was gobbler. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say goblin C words, but I don't know the average age of our, uh, our YouTube audience. So <laughs> no, but look, I think it's, I think that's completely true because what we have now, right, we have obviously people that are going to look at just the stats that don't follow the team, right, and they're going to put stuff out there and not watch the games. You're going to have other people that look at all the game tape, all the all 22, and I'm like, 
watching the all 22 is really good it's beneficial but it doesn't tell you the whole story and the reason it doesn't tell you the whole story is you don't know what's supposed to happen right you don't know and i mentioned this on one of the i can't remember what show it was it was either the post game or it was the five things that we learned this week the thing is we only know from what we can see on the play we don't actually know what the coaches are asking specific players to do and i said it's the anthony miller syndrome right we all saw as fans anthony miller getting open early on in his career but what was the coach what were the coaches saying he's getting open but he's still in the wrong place he's still not supposed to be he's not where he's supposed to be and because of that there's an interception that's thrown right and i'm not saying that that's any reason for there was an interception or a bad play by uh, fields but what i'm saying is just because we see something on game tape doesn't mean that we actually know the whole story because we could be saying, oh, well, there's this guy that feels missed. Well, yeah, but like the thing is, if Fields has, let's say, two or three seconds to throw the ball and that's supposed to be his fourth read, he's not going to get over there in time. Or let's say you see Cole Komet open in the middle of the field. Well, let's say he was supposed to be open 10 yards shorter and then Justin skies it or something like that or it goes too close. Like this is what I'm saying. It's like a lot of this, we need to contextualize a lot of the analysis. And that's why I think it's important that we look at it in terms of, yes, an analytical basis, because that's important. Analytics are really important in sport. We look at the statistics. We look at the game tape. But then what we have to do is try and make a round opinion on it. But we all know that even though we say this, our opinion is not factual because we're not in the meeting rooms. We don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. We can make educated guesses based on what we see. But the problem is there's a lot of beat reporters that do that and they do that really, really well, or people that cover the bears that do it in a really good context because they're looking at this team on a daily basis. The problem is when we look at media outlets that are a little bit further, they probably are looking at the box score and the highlights. And that's probably the range to where they do it. And look, I don't blame them because if they have to cover every team in this league, there's not the physical amount of hours in a day that you can go in deep in every single team, right? So, but that's where I think you're right, Adam, is people need to remember where they're getting some of the information from and don't just take what other people are saying. Like, have your reaction straight after the game because that's raw, right? And you could have a similar opinion and be like, feel sucks, this sucks, he's never going to make it, blah, blah. Yeah, feel your feelings always. Yeah, but then after a while of going back and watching it, you have to realize, okay, that may have not been the complete right, I guess, analysis on it because it's a straight after the game. But then later on, you need to be able to then look at the middle because that's where the truth always is. It's always in the middle. And if you get to that point, you're, you're good then. One, one good example of that. And it kind of goes to a lot of points that we've made about, about perspective and, and how people consume and digest things is there was the play uh, where Fields held it in the pocket for a while, tucked and ran, and it was his first big run of the game. And immediately there were a ton of reactions on online, on TV, on everything after the game about, you know, he tucked it and ran, which we should all be excited. It was like a 20 plus yard run, you know, and uh, well, he ran it, but he had a wide open receiver here in the flat. And uh, to your point, Ant, where it's like, he just ran a 20 yard run and we're concerned about St. Brown in the flat. And yes, he was wide open, And then uh, Tim Jenkins, who's been doing really great quarterback breakdowns. Um, He's been on the score, one of their featured guys, and he's been doing really good work with Justin Fields where he says there's some concerning things, but don't worry. And he used that play as an example. He goes, I saw entire blog posts written about how this guy's afraid to pull the trigger on a a three yard pass in the flat when the entire time all he was doing was waiting for his guy to get open and single coverage on the top. And he knew that if he didn't have that guy, he could tuck and run. He goes, by the time he checked St. Brown, he was too close to the sideline for a pass to him to be effective. But not a single article mentioned that because not a single article knew the idea of that play where they saw the single high co- uh, coverage and decided to exploit the deep ball if they could get it or, you know, take what you can get. So everybody made this entire narrative off one play that they knew nothing about. And like you said, Kieran, he knew exactly what the goal of that play was. He watched his eyes, watched him wait for this guy to beat the safety. And when he didn't, he tucked and ran and said, that's good decision making because there's no guarantee that pass to the sideline is going to get anything going. And with the way their offense was moving early, he made the right decision to take the chunk play. So it's just little things like that. And if you haven't checked out Tim Jenkins stuff, um, I, I'll I'll get the Twitter handle and pop it in the YouTube chat. But he does a really good job kind of taking the stuff that we see that we don't know what we're quite exactly seeing 
and really breaking it down with technique and fundamentals, but uh, putting it in, you know, digestible ways to say like, yes, he missed a guy here, but he's not looking here until it's way too late to throw there. And it's stuff that we don't realize the average fan that, it, you know, sometimes it goes a long way. And that's where you see two, three weeks from now, you hope that when he sees that again, he pulls the trigger. But you've got, like you said, when we were talking to uh, Weiss, new system, new mechanics, new everything. He's learning to crawl, walk, run again from square one. So if the throws are a little bit off, he said the throw to Komet uh, slipped a little bit out of his hand. You don't know if that's mechanical or what. And some of the throws where he doesn't have the zip, but then there are some throws where he absolutely throws these fireballs and you can see the vapor trail from the ball. So, you you know, when, when it clicks, it clicks. And that's what we're, when you do watch those people who break it down and know what they're seeing to say, like, watch for this next time and see if it happens again, because I bet it doesn't. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, sorry, Karen, the other thing as well that's important in that is that exact example you just gave, Adam, what was missed in all that was that he was given a clean pocket. Was that he yeah. was given he was given time, but that's not spoken about because that's no longer sexy anymore. So the O line is shit, which was the storyline going into the preseason, is not spoken about at all. Right? It's not mentioned in any way, shape, or form. Why? Because it's not shit. It's actually doing quite well. But instead, let's talk about Justin because that's the sexy cool thing, which was Kieran said. But it's not just on that. It's it's like you mentioned a great point, Adam, is that this kid is a kid. He's what is he, 23? He's never in his life, ever in his life, had a scenario where he's been questioned. And now in the last 16, 16 months in Chicago, he has been questioned about his ability. He's a human being. He's not a robot. He's going to have times where this is going to happen like this. And in fact, this is the season we want it to happen. We don't want it to happen next year. We don't want it to happen in 2024. We need to know that he's making these mistakes. And, and the point is, going into the Giants game, how does he rectify that? But it's not just about him. And their flus has said that it's not just about Justin Fields throwing the ball. It's about the separation. It's about the cleaning the routes. It's about all the whole offense as a group. And that's what encouraged me going into this week's game that it wasn't all about Justin. It was about the whole thing. I'm it's, it shouldn't, the team isn't called Justin Fields bears. It is the Chicago bears. And, and we, we, we need to realize that, that, that going into this game, it shouldn't be about, we need Justin to throw hundred and, 50,000 passes and we need Mooney to get open 400,000 times. We need to win the football game. And if we win the football game by running all day, that's how we win the football game. See, I I, I, I agree with what you're saying there, and I do, but I, I think that you are allowed to criticise Justin yep. Fields because he 100%. wasn't he wasn't great, okay? 100%. He wasn't even good. okay. And he didn't get better from, from week two to week three, which is the hard 100%. part. So, um, you know, you have, you have to allow for a fair and open discussion on this, yep. okay? Now, on Twitter, there's been people moaning about folk um, who are defending Justin Fields. There's people moaning about folk who are criticising Justin Fields. You know, everybody, and I said this before, everybody wants their take to be correct. And if their take isn't correct, then, you know, that does That's nothing else matter. by the way. Yeah, I know, man. I thought along hard about it. But, you know, so there's, there's you've, you've, got, you've got to allow an open conversation here. The other thing as well, that we're talking about these guys who break down break down tape. How many guys are out there breaking down tape every every week? And there's on Twitter or wherever. And you know, there's a couple of them that are really good at it. But the majority of them are just regurgitating the same stuff that other people are saying. Or, you know, they're 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 coming out with what they think is going on. And as you said, Kieran, you know, people are just then going off the back of that and going, well. This guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about, mm. so therefore he must be correct. Well, I'll tell you what, see if he was, see if he did know what he was talking about, he wouldn't be sitting at his computer in his house doing that. He would be employed in some capacity uh, as, as some sort of, like, you know, in, in a football club in, in some sort, whether it was uh, as a coach or a statistician or whatever it is, you know. That he wouldn't be. So this is the point I'm trying to make: is you can't just go out on a Twitter, pick a random guy, and go, well, you know, as he sounds like he knows what he's talking about, so it must be true. There's so much more to it than meets the eye. However, at the same time, you can clearly watch some of these things and make your own educated judgment based on the fact that you're a football fan, you've watched football for years, and you can see that well, that was clearly a fuck up. Or you can look at it and go, oh, that was that was actually really good. That I can tell that because I, I've got eyes. Do you know I mean like there, there's there's points to which you can criticize it and have knowledge of what you're criticizing, and then there's points where it goes beyond that, and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, um, or you don't have the full picture anyway. And and I, and I think I think there has to be a balance 
But going back to my original point is that Justin Fields wasn't great last week, and it's fine to say that because it was true. But at the same time, that's not to say that he can't get better. Again, it's the third week of the season. The first week didn't count because of the the, the rain. Do you know what I mean like this can this could turn around very easily within three, four, five weeks? And as you were talking, Adam, about winning and Justin Fields and what's the you know, or maybe it was Ant, I can't remember. What's the most important thing? You know, is it is it winning? Or is it developing Justin Fields? Well, it's both, actually. You know, because if you're not one to win a game as a, as, a, as a football team, as a sports team, then you shouldn't be a sports team. You shouldn't be involved in the team whatsoever. So absolutely go out and win. And you can do that while developing Justin Fields. The problem is, is we have an instant gratification society nowadays, and everybody wants things to happen right away. Whereas if you rewind 30 years, you'd have a quarterback sitting there and he would develop over the course of five, six, seven years and eventually become great, you know? So, sorry, I ran to the bit there, but the point I was trying to make was that everyone should have their opinion, but just be careful who you're listening to. Yeah, I, and that's the interesting thing. And like I said, it all comes down to the context. And Adam, one thing you mentioned is really good. I watched that video um, that Tim Jenkins did. And one of the things that I mentioned on our post game is I want to know whether it's just, just in missing passes, if it's something to do with the chemistry, if somebody's not beating and everybody would be saying, there's guys open. And that was the one play that I think was very, very important because I think you, I looked at it when you saw the side angle and I'm like, okay, yeah, there's two guys that were completely open where he, he could have given it in. But then if you actually look at him and Tim does a really good job of this, he, you can clearly see that Justin is looking at Darnell Mooney just as Darnell Mooney is supposed to be going across the face of the defender, but he gets bumped and gets stopped, basically. And when that happens, the play is gone because the other guys you can't throw to because if you... That was the only thing that he possibly can do in that situation. So with that particular play, because I think that's the most kind of one that's out there where people are absolutely going crazy about it. And that actually positioned that he actually made the right choice now that's not saying that justin fields had a good game he had a terrible game against um what's got the last <laughs> the, what texans, the texans. Texans. texans i was like i was like the who the hell are you playing yeah the lovies so right. little yeah. Else. <laughs> yeah so like the thing is right sometimes that's why i'm always saying context is important you can see kind of what's there but we never know exactly what is going to be happening because again we're not there we don't get to see it um, we don't get to be in those coaches meetings and all that sort of stuff. So you can only tell a certain amount. And that's what I think people need to look. Tony's right. It's re it is fair. It's completely fair to criticize Justin Fields for his performance, but don't act like you know everything about what's supposed to be happening in the offense. When realistically, even if you like, even to a certain extent, like Tim Jenkins, who does a phenomenal job knows a percentage of what's supposed to be happening on certain plays because again unless you're actually there and you're within that offense and you're with and you're in that coaching staff you can only know a certain percentage of what they're trying to do you can do it based on past analysis of other teams and what they would have done and but again you don't know exactly which read that he was supposed to go to but you can tell from what justin's looking at there some people will look at that play and they'll say well he is just staring down Mooney and because Mooney doesn't get open he doesn't have another choice but maybe it's just the fact that he was so confident that Mooney was going to get over over there and once he got over the face of the defender that he was just going to launch it and if that does happen it's a massive gain and we're not talking about this right but because it was such a poor performance we have to talk about these things we have to talk about some of the missed throws some of the bad mistakes that he made but with the caveat of saying it can still get better. He can learn from these mistakes. It, it doesn't mean that he's going to be terrible in every single game. One of the things I can't wait to talk to, to Clay about when he comes on is everybody was saying the exact same thing about Jalen Hurts last year, that Jalen Hurts couldn't throw the ball, that Jalen Hurts could only run the football, that he didn't give the Eagles an opportunity to win because he can't pass longer than 10 yards. And that's why, he, look, that's why his kind of Mo was coming into the NFL because of what happened at Alabama and stuff. But like he's come in, he's developed under a new coaching staff and he is looking like one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Sometimes it just takes time. 
And Jalen Hurts has played a lot more games than Justin Fields has played. So as fans, I think we we owe it to a guy that we've given a lot for in terms of Justin Fields is to give him time. And eventually what will happen is Justin will either sink or swim. If he swims, that's brilliant because then the Bears don't have to replace him. But if he just keeps playing terrible for a while, like I said on the post-game show, this staff doesn't have any links to Justin Fields. They didn't draft him. They didn't trade for him. They just came into a situation where he's the quarterback, and if he plays terrible for the entirety of the year, they'll probably go about trying to replace him or bringing in somebody that's going to battle him. That's just the way this is going to go now. I don't think we're even close to this coaching staff even having any sorts of kind of commitments on what they want to do at quarterback. But for now, what you just need to do is give them time. Adam, you said it best. He's played 13 games. It's not even a full season yet. Guys take time to develop. There's some guys that don't look good very early on in their career. Then suddenly year three happens where they've played all of year one, all of year two, and it clicks. And they get it. They've been in the offense to where they don't have to think. They know everything to do with the offense. They know all the coverages. They know all the alignments. They know when they need to change a play here or there. They know when they need to change something in terms of one of the receivers or if they need to switch to the run. And it becomes... You can learn this stuff, but when you learn it for the first time, it takes time to actually incorporate it because it's the same thing when you're learning like a language, right? When you're learning a language, okay, when you learn it, at, and you may know what some of the words mean and how to say it it's fine you can say it but you're actually thinking about what you want to say but then suddenly as you speak it more and more and more it becomes natural and that's what offenses are and I think people forget that the quarterback has more information than any other position on the offense and that's why I always say you've got to give guys time they'll tell you whether they're going to be able to go with it or if they're going to crash and burn and all I think as Bears fans we can do is give Justin Fields time so we can see which side of the coin he's going to be on. Yeah, he's still a baby. That's it's that simple, you know. He's he's you he's in diapers. He's going to shit himself once in a while. It's going to happen. You clean up the mess and you hope that, you know, he keeps learning and that's the best you can do. And what is it? It's like 20 games I think until you're qualified as not a rookie anymore. So it's not even one full season. It's 20 games. So, you know, yeah. you even look at that. It's like he doesn't have a full season under his belt. He's still a, technically a rookie after that. So it, it's just one of those things like just just give it time. And I know that's the hardest thing to say. And and we've had conversations about this, Tony, before. And you mentioned it earlier about the instant gratification that and someone in the chat said it, it, microwaves, microwaves ruined everything um, where it's the microwave generation. And, and Nomad said growth hurts. That's what this is. We're going to see things sometimes where it hurts. And, you know, we were so sold on this being our guy last year and blaming the coach that the first semblance of any type of not great quarterback play, people start panicking because they were convinced that once bad bald guy was out the door, everything was going to make sense again. But that's not you're here. Though. Don't worry. Aunt. We love you. Um, but no, comment. but, it, you know, once once it starts to go bad without him, then that scapegoat that everyone's had for the last three years is gone. And it's really hard to come to terms with the fact that then okay, he does have some things to do, some growth to have, because everyone's so used to what they saw in the Ohio State Championship game and hearing about all this top-end college play, which doesn't mean a damn once you get to the NFL, because how many top-end D1 guys just completely flame out once they get to the league because they can't handle it? So I think once that boogeyman was gone and people had to contend with the reality that this is who he is right now, but that doesn't mean that's who he's going to be, and that's the hardest reality that people need to understand is yes, he played like ASS, as in his words, the A word, because I love that he didn't swear. That's the most wholesomely adorable thing ever on the podium. But he played like the A word, and he acknowledged it, and I think that was huge because then when the media tries to take that narrative and drive it, he's already taken that narrative and said, yo, guys, I sucked. It That's that. So he took control of that week, and he's on to the next one. Like you said, Ant, let's just move on. And he's ready to move on by doing that. He had to answer some questions today that he didn't like, but he answered them. And you know what? He's going to go out next week, and if that's the week that it clicks, he can come back with a smirk on his face and say, all right, do we have any questions about next week or something good or whatever? And it's going to happen one day, but if it doesn't happen, people just need to breathe. That's it. It's a process, a 17-week process that we're going to get to the end of at some point. 
with the obsession with people to get their point be correct. Whether it's pro Justin Fields, or whether it's anti Justin Fields, or whether it's just pro or anti the Chicago Bears, the obsession with people that they can then go. I saw a guy on Twitter who literally tweeted 20 in a row here, look, that proves I was right in the summer. That proves I was right in the summer. And then a guy who's so unbelievably pro Justin Fields is jumping all over him. And it's like, stop. We're we're all on the same team. We want the team to win, and and it's it's a it's an obsession that's just beyond the fact of normality. It's a bit like me going bald when I was twenty one. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever as to why it should happen. It just does, and I I, I found the depression after winning a game. That's why I went on Twitter after that game on Saturday, on Sunday, and all like any negative post I would put up there. Every single time I went two and one, we won the game. Didn't we win? Did I miss something? Did we lose the game? Did Santos miss? We lost in overtime. That's what I meant. Because if you don't enjoy winning football games, why are you a fan? Stop. Go do something else. Go play golf. Go watch wrestling. Do whatever you want to do. Um, but like, I don't understand the process. And again, it's not like being a fan means you can't complain. Being a fan means you can't criticize. Hundred percent. If you want to criticize, that's completely within your right to do so. But. Do it with a bit of logic towards it. Do a bit, like, not just to prove I was right. Do it because, like, it's like if Daz Newsom ever turns up in the NFL. Like, that'd be like me going back to my tweets from, like, 2019 going, look, I knew he was great. Why are we talking about Daz Newsom? I haven't done it in months. Give me at least one chance. He's at no team. He's at home enjoying his 1.2 million. Yeah, Anthony okay. didn't even get to go to week six of the season this year to get by himself a Daz Newsome jersey. But look, you're you're right, Anthony. The the thing is, if you're not able to enjoy wins, maybe you should go and watch something else. With that, I'm going to bring in Clay Harbour. Maybe they should go and watch The Bachelor, right, Clay? Absolutely. Give <laughs> you know, it's, it gives somebody a rose. It's a, it's a lot more fun than uh, just complaining about the Bears all the time. They look, get old. How are you doing, Clay? It's, it's good to have you on. You, you've got to be really, really happy getting to see kind of the Eagles with Jalen Hurts play the way he is. Then just have to deal with all everything that's going on with the Chicago Bears. And it just seems like the way if you didn't watch the game and you just looked at Twitter, you think that they would have lost 40 to zero. It, it was insane. How are you doing? I'm great, man. And it was uh, you, you're right on there. It's crazy that you, you do get the win and everybody's just so down about it. Hey, the Bears are 2-1. and one. We got the New York Giants this week with a chance to go 3-1. and one. And the New York Giants aren't a great – they're a 2-1 football team. It's crazy to think that these two teams combined are 4-2. and two. Somebody – one of these two teams are going to be 3-1 and one after the game. It has to happen unless they tie. I don't think – that. I think the odds of that are like less than 1%. So one of these two teams are going to be 3-1. and one. I think it's going to be – our Chicago Bears, and oh, yeah. I know I'm not happy about the way it's happening. At least the fans aren't. But three and one is three and one. Maybe QB one comes around, maybe he doesn't. But I think the run game and the defense will take us to victory. Three and one this week. Yeah, one of the I can pull that. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Clay, is because look, obviously there's been a lot of talk about Justin Fields. We've all kind of said like people need to relax. It's three games into the season. He has played 13 games in total. And it kind of brought me back to a lot of the conversation around Jalen Hurts over the last couple of years. Kind of comes in, eventually gets the start when Carson Wentz wasn't doing much. And then what you're in, what you're seeing now is a guy being in kind of their system there under Nick Sirianni, being confident in what he's doing. And now you're seeing the results. They brought in some guys around him of a little bit higher talent. And now what you're seeing is he's he's thriving. And he's been one of the best passers in, in the NFL. We mentioned before, a lot of people just said he's just a, he's just a running quarterback and he, he's proven people wrong this year. And really for him, it t- just takes time. You can't, not all these kind of developments in terms of quarterback is linear. It changes for different guys. So I kind of want to ask you that just because your perspective, you obviously would have watched the Eagles very closely as well. So what is your perspective in terms of using – what we saw with Jalen Hurts and looking at fields and being fair and not just judging him on his first 13 starts. So guys, you want me to be just dead honest of what my yeah. honest 
thing is here, always. I, love, I love the Bears fans, and it's hard to sometimes to really show your tell your feelings about a cer- certain situation because you don't want to paint a, a hopeless picture. But I will say this: that it is early in Justin Fields' career. Like you guys have said, 13 starts, going on his second year. There's time. He doesn't have a great team around him. Offensive line isn't great. There's no big-time receivers. So you will have some struggles. You will have some struggles. And then last year, he wasn't even supposed to be the starter. He didn't even have the season to, to prepare to be the starting quarterback. He didn't play with the ones all training camp, all preseason. He didn't play against the ones. But so far in this preseason, I was very impressed with Fields. But so far this regular season, I mean, it's looked ugly. In the first week, the first week was a monsoon, so I'm not even counting that. But these last two weeks haven't looked good, okay? But then I look at it as these are two of his first games he's actually played. So there's there is some improvement that can and will be had. So I'm hoping and I'm banking on that, that there will be some improvement. Honestly, like you said, 13 starts, he can improve. But right now, I mean – he looks uh, – he's he's late throwing the ball. He's he's inaccurate. He's late. He's making the wrong decision. He's not making the right read on some zone option run plays. He's not making the right read on some pass plays. A lot of work to be done. But like I said, he's young. I think you're going to have to give him time. By the end of this year, I expect to see, we'll be able to see, hey, is this the guy for us or is, or is, is it not? Right now he hasn't shown anything. To, to, to tell to say to me that, hey, yeah, this is our quarterback. I don't know yet. I'm not saying this is the end-all, be-all. He, he can prove that he can, and he can prove that he can't. By the end of the year, I will make a decision. I'm like, hey, this guy will be our quarterback. This guy won't be. But I don't like the Jalen Hurts comparison because in Jalen Hurts' first season of, um, of action, he led, the, he led the Eagles to the playoffs, which, which Fields can still do. The Bears are in a great position. I mean, great position. And uh, Hertz had an 87 rating, 16 touchdowns, nine interceptions, 800 yards rushing. So, so Hertz had a, had a good year. If, if Fields had an 87 rating right now instead of a, a 70 rating or 60 rating, whatever he has, I don't have the stats in front of me right now. I would be so happy with that. People were giving Hertz a, a, a hard time because he was a middle of the road quarterback. Justin Fields is, is the worst quarterback in the league in every category, basically every statistical category. So if, if Field was even in the middle of the pack, I would be thrilled. But right now he's dead last. So obviously th- third game of the season, first game was a monsoon. Last year didn't even get the reps the, with the ones to come in and play. So that can change. But right now it's not looking good. And I think Jalen Hurts is way ahead of at this point where Justin Fields is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you, Clay. What I wanted to ask you as well, though, was in regards to Justin Fields. We were just talking about it there. You know, we're looking at this quarterback as a long-term investment. You know, we, we're not going to get that instant gratification. Like, he's going to look great right away. It's just not going to happen. What are your thoughts on the offense sort of scaling it back a bit for him? We talked about this last week after, after the game. And in terms of, you know, don't maybe look for those kind of big bombs down the field all the time. Look for the dink and dunk option pickup, you know, four, five, six yards here with some short, quick release passes. Lean on that running game that you've got. And obviously the defense is looking a bit better as well. I mean, even if you had that set up, I think the Bears could be looking like a team who could beat a lot of, lot of other teams sort of thing. So what, what are your thoughts? You think scaling it back is a good way to go and then eventually get his, his kind of confidence up and then build back into what you wanted to do originally on offense? Yeah, so I've been going back and forth on this one. A piece of me is, is you know, it's like the, uh, you know, the quote, there's no passion to be found in playing small. Go for it. Open up the playbook. If this guy can't play, he's got to learn somehow. Go downfield, throw the ball. He'll, he'll catch on. He'll catch on. Trial by fire. Just keep it going. If he throws a pick, so what? We go right back to it. We got to learn what we got right here. We're not going to win the Super Bowl this year. I think that's obvious. Let's just see what we got in Justin Fields. Then a piece of me says, let's just bring him along slowly. Let's see how many games we can squeeze out this season. Maybe you squeeze a playoff berth if you're really lucky and your run game's really good and, you know, it's possible. So I've been going back and forth on that myself, but I think they're doing the right thing. You implement the pass slowly. You try to erase 
you, you, you get them on half field reads. You can't read the full, the whole field right now. You can't. So you get them on half field reads. One to two. Okay. Can you do that? One to two. Can you do that? One to two. Get them some small reads, some small plays. And I just read this book by Adam Grant, and it's just basically the um, basically the the point is feeling right, you know, isn't as important as being right. And I think you can't. You got to be able to change your mind here and there. And if if you feel like he can make the plays, if he can't make the plays, you adjust the offense as the game's going on. And you really get a feel for how it's going, how comfortable he is with this play, how he's seeing the game that that day, and you go from there. So I think it's something that's constantly in motion and you got to feel. And I think Getsy has a decent uh, feel for that because when he hasn't been passing the ball, you guys have watched the games. Do you blame him for not passing the ball? No. No. <laughs> he's getting people no, to sir. stats. Oh, he's only throwing 10, 11 times. I watched the game. He's either getting sacked or he's throwing a pick. So run the ball, please. So, I mean, that's how I feel about it. On, on that, Clay, and, and people have commented about tight ends and, and, and the fact that maybe Cole Komet's not getting into the game. But from your perspective, watching him blocking to create those to help create those holes, um, looking back to the, to the first game of the season, he was, he was involved in, in Herbert's touchdown um, with an amazing block. How have you taken to to Cole Komet and, and the other use of the, the tight ends in the opening three games? Um, what's your read on and where the where the, t- the tight ends are now, and and what would you like to see development for them going into Week Four? Well, I don't care if Rob Gronkowski was playing with the Bears right now and, <laughs> and Shannon Sharp. Nobody's going to catch any passes. You're not. I don't care who you got out there. Nobody's catching a pass. You're not. The, the balls aren't there. So it's not Cole Komet's fault, in my opinion. People are giving Cole Komet credit because he, he dropped a five-yard stick route. Oh, great. Instead of having no catches last before last week, he had one catch for five yards. Oh, is Cole Komet not a bust now because he caught the one pass for five yards? He hasn't had the opportunity. I mean, nobody. You put Gronk, are you going to call Gronk a bust? Nobody has the opportunity to catch balls right now, so there's no statistic. There's no catches to go around. You can't judge this guy on something he can't – He he hasn't – had the opportunity to do but as far as blocking i look at pff's grade pro football focus grades at cole Komet in the blocking game you get i watched the jaguars game i watched the bears game evan ingram is rated as one of the top blockers in the league as far as a tight end i go this is insane evan ingram's been on the backside of every run he hasn't done anything but now now you people think he's a better blocker than cole Komet or on the front side of runs holding up defensive ends um blocking his ass off people think evan ingram's a better blocker than he is but Komet is 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 a very good of the reasons Khalil herbert and david montgomery's been so successful a lot of tight ends can't do david what um cole Komet does because he's a big guy he can block and he he tries hard he's an effort guy even though he's not catching the ball some guys would shut it down you're not throwing me the ball i'm not blocking yep. he's blocking his tail off every play and it's been very impressive to watch and that's why i respect Komet. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we talk, we've spoken about the things that the Bears haven't done right on, on offense, but there's been one particular thing they have done very, very well, and that is the rushing attack. And it really yeah. doesn't seem to matter who it is, whether it was David Montgomery, whether it was Khalil Herbert. And just to kind of put it, I think Khalil Herbert got slighted today, not getting one of the kind of NFC offensive players of the week. Come on, man. He, he, was, he was brilliant. He had better stats than Corderell Patterson. I, I digress. But anyway... Uh, you see that you see the offensive line who have been really good, especially in the running game. You're seeing some of these guys absolutely maul guys down there. And from the national side of things, where we were told they were going to be the worst offensive line in football, they weren't going to be able to pass block, they weren't going to be able to open holes for the running game. It's the complete opposite to what we're seeing right now. This the rushing attack looks potent, and especially like you said. When you can't pass the ball, it should make it difficult to run the ball because teams should know what you're doing. But what they've done to start the season has been nothing short of phenomenal. They've been, I think, ranked number two overall in the NFL right now in the rushing attack. So what's been your opinion of, I know Montgomery is now injured, but of both Monty and Khalil Herbert to start the season? I think you got to give um, you got to give a lot of credit to these to this offensive line. This offensive line doesn't even have full strength. Obviously, you got Sam Musfer in there when, when you're supposed to have Lucas Patrick and Tevin Jenkins. I love Tevin Jenkins. I hope he gets more snaps, and I hope he can move Lucas Patrick over soon because Tevin Jenkins is a hard-nosed physical player too. 
Braxton Jones, one of the steals of the draft, in my opinion. I mean, he's not playing great, but he's playing as good as any any of these tackles. Evan Neal, you see any of these big tackles in the draft? Uh, he's doing a great job. He's holding his own. He's not getting dominated. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Cody Whitehair, we know he's a solid player, hard-nosed guy, um, consistent veteran. Uh, Larry Borum has, has been solid. You'll see he'll give up pressure or sack here and there. But uh, as far as running the ball, all these guys have been great. They give great effort. They've been doing a great job in the run game. And Kari Blossom game is uh, doing a great job as well. And I'm looking at the rankings again to see where he is. And how is this guy rated so low as a fullback? Every play I watch him, you know, he's doing his job and he's making – making a hole and creating some good contact. So sometimes you just got to watch the tape and he does a great job. So overall, these guys have, and the receivers, I've never seen, these receivers aren't getting the ball thrown to them, but they're all blocking their tails off. These guys are blocked. These guys are bought in. They're playing hard in the run game. You don't see receivers like that often that are willing to give so much effort in the run game, knowing they're not getting the ball thrown to them. That's impressive too. These long runs, that's because the receiver, instead of 10 yards, you bust a 30-yarder. That's why the receiver's blocking the safety. He's blocking the second level. So I've been really impressed with they've, what they've been able to do in the run game. And the Giants got the 25th-ranked run defense in the league. I think we're going to see a lot more rushes. They gave up 135 yards to the Cowboys last week. So I think we're going to see a lot of rushing yards this week and a lot of not a lot of more runs, even though Dalton Schultz, um, not Dalton Schultz, uh, Cooper Rush. I'm sorry. I don't think Dalton Schultz is taking the snaps at quarterback, <laughs> but uh, Cooper Rush had a 98 rating against against the Giants. So hopefully QB1 can have a good game if, you know, if C- Cooper Rush can, can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And look, all we have to do is go back to week 16 last season. Bears win 29-3. Andy Dalton was the quarterback for that game because Justin Fields was injured. And again, they're able to mix it up a little bit. Defense was really good in that game. And it's going to come to a lot of the same proponents this time. And when you look at the Bears defense, the one thing is even when the kind of run stopping hasn't been there, you're still seeing this defense fly to the football, trying to punch the ball out. And we had obviously two interceptions last week, but there was also two forced fumbles that we just didn't get back. And how important do you think that's been for this defense? That it seems like every single game, even when they're outmatched a little bit by the Packers, they were still able to get takeaways. And at the end of the day, most of the time when you win the turnover battle, you end up winning the football game. For some reason, some teams have a knack for taking away the ball. And some teams don't. And I've never been able to pinpoint it all my years of playing football and, Every team is you got to get takeaways. You got to take care of the ball. Every it's the same. I, I play for five teams. Everybody emphasizes it. Everybody wants. To, for some reason, some teams are better at it. People say, "Oh, the hits principle." It's the hits. Every team says it. Every team emphasizes it. Some teams have a better knack for it. I think this Bears team has a knack for it. They're going to take away the football, and they've been doing it. I think this is something that they can keep up all year all year long. You take away the football. You run the football. You're going to have a chance to win some games. And you're going to have a chance to pull some upsets too. So I don't know why they've been able to do it. they got some guys that are focused on taking away the football. I know a lot of people say the same things, but you see the guys are punching the ball. They're making a tackle, they're punching the ball. It's something you want to see, see them continue to do, and you love to see the results. So I hope they continue to take away the ball and keep them in a lot of football games. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one of the other nice things is a lot of there was a lot of criticism after the Packers game for Roquan Smith. And then he comes back, 16 tackles, a couple of tackles for loss, and the all important interception to to win that football game. How impressed have you been with Roquan, considering everything that went on? Like the whole contract dispute, not playing for the entire training camp until the very end. It looks like he has his legs under him now and he's raring to go and had an absolute phenomenal week um, last week. Well, just the fact that this guy didn't he didn't play in the preseason, he didn't practice, and he comes in and starts playing. I don't care who you are. That's, imp- that's impressive to even be able to be on the field. I know I couldn't do that, not practice, not play, step on the field, make plays. Obviously, he's getting his feet under him right now, like as you said. But the biggest thing is he wasn't playing or practicing, and this is a new defensive system. This isn't the same system he was running. This isn't a 3-4 defense. This is a 4-3 defense. It's very different. 
you have to play more downhill. You have to play off of blocks differently. It's a complete different system. So I think he's recognizing that and he's, he's seeing how to play that. And I had a bunch of clips that I was going to post on the on Twitter about uh, how, how well Roquan played in this game. I just haven't got around to it. But he's doing well, man. He's coming downhill. He's finding holes, gaps in the offensive line. He's shooting them. He's playing fast and far cry different. It's just the difference a week makes. He's seen him against the Packers or not. Then he comes back and against the Texans, and he's playing a completely different game. So I think this is the Roquan we're going to see moving forward. It's hard to play in the NFL without practicing, without playing those preseason games. So right now, basically got those preseason games out the way, and I think he's ready. Just, just on that as well, and, and you bring up a point, but if you look back to the start of the season, so before the season started, looking into the three games, everyone's talking about whether we're going to win them, whether we're going to lose them. But if you forget about the results for a second, do you think we are where you thought we would be right now? Do you think, is there a position that you're like, okay, we're much better than I thought we are right now? Obviously, everyone's going to say Justin needs to improve. I get that. But if you if you take that away, is there is there a position group that you're like, yeah, do you know what? They're better than I thought I was. And on the flip side, is there a position group that you're like, actually, you know, this is this is not as good as I thought we would be in week three going into week four? The Bears are who we thought they were. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the Bears are who we thought they were. And we yeah. love them. R.I.P. Denny Green. I'm sorry I, ha- I couldn't pass that one off. If you guys remember that one back in the day, Denny Green. It was great. The Vikings, when they, they lost the Brian Urlacher, Lance Briggs led Bears. Denny Green was hot. But um, I think there's there's some ups and some downs. So I think our running game is much better than I thought they would be. These guys were impressive. They're opening holes. These linemen are getting so much movement on that line of scrimmage. It's a beautiful thing to watch. As a tight end, I, I teared up a couple times watching these line, all this movement they're getting. I go, man, this is a beautiful thing. This movement is incredible. I didn't think they are going to be able to do that. And I will say, obviously, it's only the third week. I thought QB1 after this preseason, I was on the train. I was sipping the, sizz- the syrup. I was ready. I was all in on Justin Fields, man. I'm like, hey, I'm like, hey, this guy can play, and I think he can come back and start playing like he did in the preseason. But uh, So he's a little bit behind where I thought he would be, but this offensive line, this running game's ahead. I can't really judge the receivers because, I mean, they really haven't had an opportunity to catch balls. I mean, Mooney had the one drop last week. He didn't run a great route, but he was still open, dropped it. And besides that, you know, you can't really judge him. As far as the defense is concerned, um, I expected more from Kyler Gordon. He had a couple big plays last week, but, I mean, man, he's getting beat like a stepchild out there, and I'm not very comfortable with him yet. And I got he's a rookie. It's his third game playing cornerback, one of the toughest positions in football. But he's been getting picked on like, like he's – like the he's three foot tall and in fifth grade and there's a bully that needs some lunch money. I mean, it hasn't been pretty for him. Um, Brisker, I think he's, he's been looking up and down. I, you know, he'll, I think he'll com- continue to improve, you know, Roquan starting to get back to form. So besides that, besides the running game and QB one, I think everything else is kind of where, where I thought they would be. And I think it's a good spot. You're two and one. You can come in and sneak out a win against the giants. You go back three and one, Try to get QB1 playing well and see what happens. I was going to ask you a question about the, the game on Sunday, Clay, but I'm actually going to ask you a question just because we're talking about evaluating the players. And I just wanted to go back to, to Justin Fields very quickly before we move on. Um, and you've talked about watching the Jaguars this season and Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. Obviously, those two guys, you know, they, they've, they've been totally loggerheads all through high school you know, college and then obviously now NFL level, they've been compared as the two top players in their sort of year. What are you see? I mean, in terms of, we've looked at Trevor Lawrence, you know, his QB ratings are way up high. He's looking like he's having success on the field. For you watching those games, because I haven't watched a lot, of, a lot of Jags games this season, I'll be honest, in full anyway. Um, what are you seeing from him that's different from what you're seeing from Justin? Is it that it's what's round about him? Or is it something else? And I ask that because as you, yeah. as, as a player, you, you'll recognize things that maybe some other people don't recognize. I just wanted to get your kind of take on that. Okay, so I went to three training camps this year. I went to the Bears, obviously, in my hometown, Chicago. I went to Philly, and I went to Jacksonville. So I got to see Trevor Lawrence, Jalen Hurts, and 
uh, Justin Fields, obviously. And I remember when I, I tweeted some stuff out and they said, I said, Jalen Hurts looks great. He is miles ahead of where I think Justin Fields is. And I got a lot of pushback because they're like, hey, he's older. He's seen more games. I'm not saying, I'm just saying that he was ahead of the reason I was saying because he's getting the ball out quicker and they can anticipate throws. The hardest thing for these guys to do is to be able to anticipate, anticipate breaks, anticipate throws, anticipate holes in the zone, and to throw the ball there and trust it as quarterback. And, and Jalen Hurts and Trevor Lawrence can do that. Trevor Lawrence was is third in the league so far at 2.6 seconds at getting the ball out, releasing the football. You know who's dead last? Dan Jones. You know who's second to last? Justin Fields. He's holding the ball too long. Who, which teams has given up the most sacks in the league? I mean, you look at the Bears and the Giants at the bottom league. Oh, they're offensive line. They're offensive line. Sometimes Justin Fields back here like he doesn't see the pass rush coming. Bro, you can see them. That guy's six foot six, 300 pounds. You see him coming. Get rid of the ball. You're holding the ball longer than any quarterback in the league. Trevor Lawrence is getting it faster, besides Tom Brady, faster than him and Kyler Murray than any other quarterback in the league. And that's what you see with Trevor Lawrence. You'll say Trevor Lawrence has a lot more weapons around him right now. Zay Jones, Christian Kirk, they signed Evan Ingram. But I, you look at the film, there's still guys open there. There's guys open in some situations, and Fields is, is hesitating. And you look at Lawrence, he, he has more offensive-minded coaches around him. Doug Peterson, offensive coordinator as a head coach, co former quarterback, played 10-plus years in the league, right? Who's Trevor Lawrence's quarterback coach? Mike Boy. Mike McCoy coached Trevor or coached Peyton Manning. He coached Phillip Rivers. And he he was the head coach for five, six years in the league. And now his only player, he's, he's a quarterback coach, only player he has to worry about is Trevor Lawrence. Then you bring in passing game coordinator. What the heck do they do? Jim Bob Cooter, former offensive coordinator, former quarterback at University of Tech, Tennessee. Press Taylor is the actual offensive coordinator. Quarterback guy. Trevor Lawrence has four guys there for him to help him. And it's showing. And Justin Fields needs that same type of type of tutelage. He needs the same amount of mentors to get him there. And obviously, you got to put more weapons around him. But you see it paying off. And the difference, and just on the field difference, is the quickness of getting the ball out and the decision making. Half of these sacks, Trevor Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence gave up zero sacks for two weeks in a row for the first time for the Jaguars. I don't remember how long. Is because of Jags' offensive line of Juwan Taylor. Rookie Luke Fortner, Ben Barsh, and Cam Robinson are so great. No, he's getting the ball out quick. You give me – that's why I'm confident that it won't blow on Philadelphia. Oh, their defensive line. That These guys have two two seconds to get, get to the quarterback. If you have two seconds to get to the quarterback, that's hard to do. I mean, you're basically – you have to basically be running without any – anything in your way to get to the quarterback in two seconds. When you hold the ball like Justin Fields for 3.1, 3.2 seconds, it becomes a little bit easier. You, you can set them up. You can get a push. And, you know, it's all about how fast you can get rid of the ball. You hear these people, oh, he, he got, got five sacks last week, this offense. Get rid of the ball faster. There's three of them that should have been sacks. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's something that we've all said that, Justin needs to do better. He needs to be able to just get rid of the ball quickly. It was it was something that we spoke about last year and why Nagy went after Andy Dalton was just because he likes to deliver the ball quickly. And that's what he wanted in, in the offense. And it's the one thing that Justin hasn't been able to do. Is it because it's something that he needs to change in his own mindset? Is it just the relationship with some of these receivers, because like we said, it, you pretty much have Darnell Mooney from last year and everybody else is new and you're having to trust some of these guys and you can kind of see him being delayed a little bit is does he have the belief that these guys are going to get open? And even if they are, it's one of those that hopefully as you see the chemistry start to build, there's better performances coming from, from Justin this season. That's what you have to hope for moving forward. But look, before we let you go, Clay, and one of the things I want to, to ask you is when you look at this game here, what are the three keys that you believe would lead to a Bears victory against the Giants on Sunday? First off, you got to run the football. We can't, obviously, right now, you can't trust the pass game and you want to slowly bring that along. This team gave up over 130 rushing yards last week. You, you had over 200 and 
I don't know. You guys might know the exact stats. 200 and I don't know how many yards. But anyways, Herbert. 281. Big I think it was. 281. Keep running the football. Keep running the football. And then you got to stop the run. Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones can both run the football. They want to run. Brian Dable, my old tight end coach for New England, loves running the football. Loves it. If you can't lock for him as a tight end, he wasn't going to have you. He loves pounding the rock. He loves being physical. Daniel Jones isn't a good quarterback. The only quarterback in the league that held the ball, holds the ball longer than Justin Fields, and we know how long Justin Fields holds the football, is Daniel Jones. These guys are having competitions, watching each other on the sideline, saying, I'm going to hold the ball longer than him today. No, I'm going to hold the ball longer than him. Defensive line's got to get to him. This is a great opportunity to get some sacks. Daniel Jones got sacked five times last week. Was it because his offensive line was bad or was it because he's sitting there back there uh, staring at the, the weeds and the grass and he saw a cute girl in the stand? Then he tries to throw the ball. I don't know. They can get to Daniel Jones, run the football, get to Daniel Jones, stop the run. I Bears can get away with victory. Yeah, look, what Daniel Jones is probably doing is trying to look for a cute girl that can give a rose to. That's what it is, Clay. We start off, we start off with you coming on but with the bathroom. We leave you going with the bathroom. Okay. You guys watch Paradise? You guys ever watched Bathroom Paradise? It just came on last night. It was the first week of it. I I haven't seen it personally, but I know I, I did see you tweet about uh the bathroom over the last couple of days. It's it's uh it, it's an interest. I know there's a lot of people that watch it. It's has it look has a little bit of a cult following over there and but yeah look it's it's really really good and look clay first of all i just want to thank you for coming on it we've had you a, a couple of times in the show i really enjoy some of your breakdowns as well over on on twitter you get really honest analysis which i think is really important because there's some people that'll be out there they know something that will hit well but sometimes you need to be hit with a bit of honesty and i think that's really really good and look we really appreciate you coming on today clay Appreciate it, fellas. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Clay. See you later. All right. That was good. That was fun having Clay on the show. I always enjoy because the thing for him is he doesn't have to be honest. He's a Bears fan because he's born in the area. He played for other teams. He's still obviously big into the Jackson Jaguars, he's still big into the Philadelphia Eagles. But I think it's important to have that little bit of honesty because, look, you, you have to look at it and, yes, Justin hasn't done well at the start of the season. But like we said, there's still optimism there that things can develop. It's three games into the season. We've seen some of the the problems of other teams. Like It's not like there's 10, 15, 20 quarterbacks that are lighting it up in the league right now. There's a lot of players out there that are struggling. Justin just needs to... He needs to get his act together right now and kind of show um, what he's made of here. But look, one of the topics that we did last week that I thought was really, really good, and it's going to be kind of a staple on the show pretty much every single preview. Um, one of the guys, you've seen him, he was on the Five Things show just two days ago. Seth um, does an article every single week on the on the network. So that's the irishbearsnetwork.com. And he does a... Th- three up and three down for Bears players on a week-to-week basis. Uh, so a couple of guys, and it's interestingly enough, we did this last week. Some of them were on the downs from last week, and now they are on the ups from this week. So first of all, we have Roquan Smith. So yeah, he was on one of the downs last week, and then suddenly he just explodes this week. So what Seth puts in his column is, um, this is the week many were waiting for. It was clear in the first few weeks that Smith was out of position, overthinking, and playing slow. Sunday was a different story. Smith was flying to the ball and playing fast, instinctive football. He racked up 16 tackles and a game-sealing interception. He will need to continue this level of play next week as the defense prepares to take on a rejuvenated Saquon Barkley. Completely agree. Um, Saquon is going to be the key for... For the Bears to be able to stop in order for them to be successful against the New York Giants. But look, with that, I know this is going to be a very short answer for you guys. Do you all agree with this, that uh, Rokon Smith is on the three ups this week? Yep. Yes. Way up. Yeah. He took fair. Pelters last last week, and he obviously listened because he's uh, he's turned it around. Fair play to you, Roquan. 
Yeah, absolutely. The second one is another very, very obvious one. I, I think it was an easy enough week to do the three ups here. Um, but yeah, the second one was Khalil Herbert, obviously. So what he says is fans have been making calls for more carries for Herbert with Montgomery's injury. He was thrust into action. Herbert absolutely rose to the occasion. He ran for 157 yards, two touchdowns on 20 carries. I think it was like a 7.85 average or around those lines. Uh, he looked explosive and strong with 132 of those yards coming after contact. If Montgomery misses time moving forward, they should feel confident that Herbert getting of him getting 15 to 20 carries a game. Now that's an interesting one, the 132 yards after contact. Because before this, I don't think Herbert was seen as a guy that it gets loads of those after contact yards early in his career. We all saw it in the, at the college level because he's a little bit kind of smaller than what we've seen in Dave Montgomery, who just seems to have this innate act for when he's going down. He has this lower center of gravity that he's somehow able to cut even when he's getting tackled. But Herbert has shown it as well. Getting 132 of those yards coming after contact is really, really important. But also it's really, really interesting that he's been able to add that to his game. So, look, I know everyone's going to agree with um, – kind of the analysis to put him in the three ups, but do any of you have any thoughts on that? The fact that he got 132 yards after contact. Yeah, I, no, think, cool. the, <laughs> I think the big I think the big thing for Khalil Herbert is to back it up. Yeah. And what we now need to see is Khalil Herbert back it up this week in a game that is against a team that people are saying you can run the football on. So this is a big week for Khalil Herbert. We want him next week to be in three ups again because it shows consistency as to what it is. We haven't seen that yet from him. He's shown a lot of talent, and if if Montgomery's out for any period of time, and uh, we need we need this guy to to be consistent and to, to run the football like that. But the other thing as well, he was given that opportunity by some unbelievable O line play in creating those holes and creating those scenarios. And I'm really I'm really happy that Clay mentioned it on the wide receivers as well on his massive run. Um, you see Montgomery, or you see Mooney working his ass off to make a big important block that created that extra after the after the yards run. So those are the kind of things that you know that the team is still in. If we're in week 9, 10, and 11, where it gets worrying is if those guys aren't making those plays. That's when you can start worrying about it when, when stuff like that is what you see. If you see someone acting like Alan Robinson did uh, last season, if you start seeing that, then you start worrying about what's going on with, with, the, with, the, with the changing room and, and what's going on. But yeah, clear, Herbert did a fantastic job and that whole running unit as a group did a fantastic job. Yeah, absolutely. And his third up this week, again, a uh, pretty easy one for people to, to guess who it is. It's Eddie Jackson. So if there's one player on this defense that has benefited the most from the scheme change, it has to be Eddie Jackson. He has, incre he has incredibly solid against the run and the pass. He was finally able to get his interception to break his dry spell. Uh, good things happening when Jackson plays like he has this season, obviously. And obviously the important stuff that the Bears are 12-0 and when Eddie Jackson has an interception. May that continue. It's an incredible stat to have and get him around the football so that can just continue because, look, a good, we said this to start the season. A good Eddie Jackson is a good thing for the Bears because he was a difference maker in 2018 and in 2017 and he lost that a little bit. Maybe it was just the guys that were with him. Maybe it's the fact that Brisker has come in and he's lightened the load on some of the other kind of obligations of the safeties. And he's just able to free roam around the field and be in those positions to make plays. And that's where you want to see Eddie Jackson. He, he should be one of those guys that can be a difference maker that you might be up against it. A team might be nearly about to score and suddenly he picks the ball off in space and you completely flip the field. That's what Eddie Jackson does best. And, completely agree with that do you guys kind of feel the same way that he was one of the the three ups this week yeah um, and so go ahead you go. after you my friend i, I was just going to make a, a quirky comment that only takes about a second so i'll let you go first um it, it, we you know ant and i talked about it after the packers game that you know we on behalf of the show we apologize to eddie jackson because when it all fell apart after all the missed tackles who was the guy stepping up and making the hit even if he wasn't making the tackle doing the thing we know for a fact he does not like to do he looks rejuvenated it's like all those tv shows now where you've got the aging country music star and then they pair them with the young musician and suddenly they're rejuvenated and 
oh yeah, let's add a little hip hop to our music. And you know, they're adding to the routine. So you see him now and he's doing things that he didn't even excel at before, but he's making a difference in doing those things, even if he's not the guy to, to finish the play. So you're seeing a lot of things that he did well because Brisker's there helping him out, but you're seeing him do things that we never really saw him look comfortable doing now, just because it's what the defense predicates that, you know, you go hustle and do, and I, it was what uh, J Johnson said, I think that, you know, he who taketh the ball away or he who, who hustles to the ball, taketh the ball away. And that's the mantra they're, or they're, they're operating under. And you see it in Eddie Jackson. And, you know, I, I hope all 17 weeks, he just keeps going up and up and, you know, we keep seeing it because there are a lot of people, I would say probably he's the one that the most people are wrong about. We're still, you know, Jerry's still out on the quarterback, Jerry's still out on a lot, but I would say as close to a, a majority as we we could be, a lot of people were sure Eddie Jackson was cooked. And here he is, you know, looking like a, a better version of what he was. Obviously that big year with the turnovers was, you know, impressive, but he looks like a complete safety now playing alongside Jaquan Brisker. Yeah, completely agree. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, He's become a serial takeaway machine. Oh my god, I hate you! <laughs> I hate you. Get off the <laughs> Oh my god! All right, let's go to the bad side of things. And <laughs> that's free. That's down. That one's down. Yeah, yeah that's that down. Was... <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to like. Sub... I'm sorry, Seth. I'm going to substitute Justin Fields out and just put Tony <laughs> in instead, just because of that comment. <laughs> Jesus. But yeah, look, obviously <laughs> Justin Fields was one of them that was that was one of his downs. He mentions that he had a very rough start, and that's putting it lightly. And uh, he still has all the talent in the world to succeed. That being said, he has a ton to prove moving forward. Going into the season, the theme was how can Justin Fields succeed with no line or receivers that can't get open? That excuse has been tossed out the window so far because the offensive line has been well above average. And if you watch the film, receivers are getting open. Several times um, Sunday, wide receivers were open. Uh, not just slightly open, but wide open with three to five yards of separation. It's looking as though he is thinking far too much and scared to make a mistake. Fields has to start throwing with confidence, or this could be a reoccurring team week to week. So, yeah, that is a, it's a little bit daunting there. Second one is Darnell Mooney. Um, so obviously he's not been hitting the heights that we would have expected from Mooney. He obviously had that key drop, and then suddenly because of that, he decided to stay at Soldier Field in his gear after the game and just go on the drugs machine. Uh, he said, going into the season, the media went out of their way to say Mooney will never be a true number one receiver. He has done nothing to refute that through three weeks. He was credited for two drops on Sunday, one of which was a poorly thrown ball, and that cannot happen. A good portion of the blame should rightfully fall on fields. That being said, Mooney has to do better. Through three weeks, he has four catches for 27 yards. This is just not acceptable from a top receiver. His passing offense is struggling, and it needs more fields and Mooney if it's going to take off. And look, I completely agree in that one, and we kind of mentioned it at the top of the show. If you're going to be one of the guys that's saying that they're going to be a number one receiver, you got to prove that you're a number one receiver. And even when an offense is struggling, you got to make plays. Um, you got to bail your quarterback out, make it easy for him as well. Man, he hasn't done any of that to start the season. So I agree that his stock would be down right now. And the last one's an interesting one. Uh, without, uh, like, I, if you had to guess who the third one is, guys. Who do you think that Seth has put in his column for being the last guy to go down? Robert Quinn. No. Anthony? Um, Muhammad. No, and Adam? Um, I'm going to say, ooh, I don't even know what side of the ball it's going to be. Uh, Kyler Gordon, I guess. No, it's actually Lucas Patrick. Ah, so Lucas Patrick, and look, we've all been saying that he needs to be starting at center and all this. But what he says is this was not one of Patrick's best games. That could easily be contributed to the fact that he has been on a constant rotation with Jenkins at right guard. It's clear that this rotation isn't what's best for the team. Jenkins has been rather successful and could benefit from more playing time. The obvious decision to make is to slide Patrick in at center moving forward. He was brought in to be the team's starting center. It is time to see what he can bring to the table. Mustafa has been a solid stand-in, but this line needs to take it to the next level. Rotating Patrick at guard is not going to make that happen. It is time to see who the best center on the roster is. The Bears need to have the best five on the field for the entire game. It may end up being that Mustafa is the choice, 
but you won't know if you don't try. And like where I where I do kind of agree with him on this is the fact that when you see the two guys rotating, Jenkins just looks like the better offensive lineman at, at guard. And for a guy that what six weeks ago everybody was gonna be saying that he was getting traded, like it's a tough situation to be in, but we want to see Patrick be at center. So you don't have to have a guy that's constantly rotating. Um, I think that's really, really important for the next step of this bears offense that you do that. So you just have your five best out there. And like, it's the one little nitpick that I have from this coaching staff, because they told us at the start, be the five best. Well, decide who your five best is. I think there's an important caveat to that though, because it's, there's a purpose that they're doing it, but they told us what the purpose was. And they explicitly told us that that purpose might not necessitate the five best. And I think that's where like, I agree. Jenkins should be the starting guard when it's all there, but I would also much rather have a Lucas Patrick where he can last three, four quarters than a guy being tired. And that's what it's necessitating where this is about game shape. It's not about practice reps. It's not about running sprints on the side. It's about game shape. And if you've never played football before, Game shape and practice shape are two completely different beasts. So where that makes sense, and, you know, I'm in a little tongue-in-cheek with this one, but, hey, guys, we're 2 and one relax. You know, the, the guard rotation's not hurting the team. Um, it's But, you know, it's the, the reason that they're doing it does not follow the logic that they went into everything with. But, again, them explaining why they're doing what they're doing and, uh, you know, letting us know that this is done for the future because when our line is ready – we want him to be ready. Think, you know, Khalil Mack that week against Green Bay, where by the third quarter, he was gassed. And we, yeah. you know, Aaron Rodgers came back on Percocets and kicked our ass. Um, so, you, you know, you look at that and, and you can kind of see that logic of, again, if we're a Super Bowl contending team and you're probably going best five regardless, and you, you live with potentially, you know, Lucas Patrick being a little winded, but in something like this, where, it, the, you know, the running game's still moving, you had 281 rushing yards, while doing a stupid rotation that does not necessitate the best offensive line, that at least lets you know that, you know, Jenkins has looked good when he's in there. But also the reason Lucas Patrick started last week is because the coaching staff said he had his worst week at practice at right guard. So, yeah, people are pissed that Lucas Patrick started, but they also, again, were honest with us that there's a reason that Lucas Patrick started. He might not have looked as great in the game, and that's understandable because Tevin Jenkins is that dude, in my opinion, and he profiled really well as a guard from the beginning. But, you know, there, that's that's kind of, again, where there's that gray area of I think everybody on uh, in this fan base would love to have Te Tevin Jenkins be the 100 percent of snap starter. But also people are going to be pissed. And if Lucas Patrick looks tired in the second half against the Giants, when we should be running the ball on them for however many yards. Now, I don't know if he's starting this week or not. I know he's snapping the ball again and kind of thing where it's like it sucks and it's not ideal, but it's also not hampering things. And at the end of the day, there is some growth that Tevin needs to have as well. But I'd rather have both of them working there and then have Patrick be ready to plug in. Then all of a sudden you've got a tired Lucas Patrick and a Tevin Jenkins who maybe has been in a situation he's not used to next to, you know, a young Larry Borum who he's been very hit or miss. So it, it's kind of tough. And that's where that balance of we've got, you know, we didn't even know who our offensive line was going to be going into this. And then suddenly we sign Riley reef and Michael Schofield. And neither of those guys have even played reefs only played a couple uh, snaps on, you know, big packages, which he had a great block on one of the, the touchdown runs recently, but, you know, we, we signed the two guys who are the saviors. They're not even playing. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny to see how that works out and watch the development. But within, you know, this week or next week, Lucas Patrick's going to be starting at center and it's all a moot point. But we're still two and one with a stupid guard rotation. And, yeah. uh, you know, a young guy who's never really played guard at this level before who looks good. So, again, just take the positives away from it that, you know, Patrick didn't look great there, but they're not relying on him to play guard. Uh, the guy who's going to be playing guard the rest of the season once Lucas Patrick's there, and which I think is going to help the pass protections a lot because Sam Mustafer uh, is not that guy up there. Um, but that's a whole other story to, to, to talk about. But, you know, it, it's dumb and I get it. And it's not what people want to see, but they let us know why they're doing it. And it makes sense. And again, we're winning football games. We're running the ball down people's throats, no matter who's in there. Just enjoy the ride while we there's some going to be some logical inconsistencies on the way. But as long as it doesn't hamper the team, it's it's nothing we can control. Just, you know, see what happens. Lucas Patrick's not a guard. Now we know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's really good because we look at this going forward and like people are losing their minds over how the team have performed on offense in terms of the passing game. But like at the end of the day, you have an opportunity here to go three and one on your first four games of the season. And that's a really good position to be in. If 
you had confidence. If the, like if you were doing the same thing, right? And let's say the passing game was kind of where you would expect it to be, and you won maybe the games that you won by, let's say five, six, or seven more points. Like at the end of the day, you still have the same amount of wins. It doesn't matter, right? What you have to hope for now is that the team can develop to where you can build that that part of your offense because if you can do that then there's confidence within the fan base and i think that's why anthony i think you were right in saying it that the most important thing when it comes to the end of this you're especially with a new regime i keep saying this to people when it's a new coaching staff you can't just go in and lose like 13 games you can't do it you can't want to you can't want to be going for draft picks because as a coach you've got to be you've got to have some sort of success and then people believe in what you're teaching them. Like if Eva Flus came in here and they won one football game, well then why the hell would any of these players believe what he's coaching them? Because they're like, well, it doesn't work what you're doing. Like that's why I think it is really important. And look, it's going to be interesting this week because it's a winnable football game against the Giants. I think that if the Bears can stop Saquon Barkley and force Daniel Jones to beat you, you probably win this football game. If you can't tackle Saquon Barkley like you proved you couldn't tackle Aaron Jones, well, then you could well lose this football game. And look, the one thing that I would say is the defense, they need to get after the quarterback if they can. Because like we said, Evan Neal, even as a first-round rookie, he struggled early on this season. you got to go after them. you got to be aggressive. And then on offense, it's like we said, if you're going to be – using a good amount of the passing game has to be quick passes. Get it out there as quickly as possible. Do not let them go and and blitz you because that's what they're going to try and do. So if that's the case, make it some easy throws for your receivers just to get open. I think Cole Komet's going to need to be a vital part of this passing attack this week if it's going to be successful. And obviously you need to, you need to go in the running game. You need to make sure that you have Khalil Herbert that's ace in the running game that if – Montgomery is going to be out, I, I would assume so, that Traston Ebner is ready for some of the touches that he's going to get because you can't have Herbert going 25 to 30 touches a game. You need to kind of relax it a little bit, let him be efficient in his touches, but also put in Ebner as well. So look, with that, we're going to come to the last segment of the show where we give our bold predictions and our game predictions for this week. Um, I'm going to do a backwards here. Normally I go in the right corner and come around. This time I'm going to start with Tony. Then it's going to be Anthony. And then it's going to be Adam. And then I'll finish it off myself. So Tony, what is your both prediction? And what is your game prediction for this week? So my bold prediction is that we're going to see a repeat of the Khalil Herbert um, heroics. Um, He's going to have at least 130 yard rushing um, and uh, and two touchdowns. That's my bold prediction. Um, for the actual score, I kind of went back and forward with this wee bit because, but, but then I, I look at the I look at the Giants. There's a lot of similarities between us and the Giants. The only difference is um, Daniel Jones has looked a bit more comfortable than Justin Fields has. But even at that, he's not as talented a quarterback, I don't think. Although he does, he has rushed for some like 120 yards over the first three games himself. So he's getting about. He's getting about. Um, but I'm going to go with 17-14 um, Bears win. Okay, Anthony, I'm going to go to you next. So first of all, your both prediction, and then following your score prediction. Yeah, I'm similar to Tony in the sense of Khalil Herbert, but instead of going with that, I'm going to go with Ebner because uh, I just have a feeling that we might see uh, a big game from him in the same way that what seems to be a lot of work within the Bears running game is that they have that two-pronged attack. And with Montgomery out, they're going to be probably looking at Ebner unless Evans comes up from the, from the practice squad. But I, I would see a lot, of, a lot of stuff on Ebner and he may find the holes that um, Herbert was finding um, open up for him, so I think you might see a biggish game from him. Um, regarding the score, yeah, I, I think this is going to overtime, I really do. I think this is going to be an unbelievably close game. Um, and 
I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's going to be a blowout and the Bears absolutely destroyed them, but I just think it's going to be really close. And it comes down to whether Saquon is in beast mode and we can't control him or whether we can control him. I think this is this is that going to be that tight. Um, I'm going to go with Bears win at 23-20, but it could flip and it could be 23-20 to the Giants. I think it's going to be unbelievably close. Okay, very, very good. Adam, your turn. What is your bold prediction? What is your score prediction? Well, every week, my bold prediction is that Tristan Ebner is going to score. But since Ant took that, he is our best route runner after all. But uh, you, uh... My, my, my bold prediction, <laughs> you're not staying in my house anymore. Wait. Um, <laughs> uh, so my my bold prediction is, is Valus Jones Jr. actually suiting up a bold prediction or do yes. I have to go touchdown? Because, yeah. you know, um, but I, you know, I, I think that, you know, he's going to suit up and I, and I think that he very well could be the guy to at least take a little pressure off the top. And if, even if they don't throw it to him, just run over, run past the safeties a few times and they're going to have to account for you. Um, we haven't had much of that, obviously, with the lack of time. And then score wise, I think both teams are going to run wild like Hulkamania, but I do think the Bears are the better team. Um, you know, not a lot New York uh, defensively for New York. They've seen some line struggles. I don't think Danny Dimes is it. Um, and you know, they're going to throw some pressure in his face and get to him. And I think the bears are going to come out victorious 31, 27. And I think Herbert and Saquon Barkley might set the the world record for most combined rushing yards in a game. Did you yeah, see 31 that, that, points? The bears are going to yeah. score oh, 31 points. I think it's going to be a real sloppy defensive game and both teams are going to have some, I mean, you look at like Herbert's 130, whatever, 120, however many yards after contact, that was, a lot of that was just arm tackles and he met in the hole by a couple sloppy arm tackles and there he goes. And that's a disciplined Lovey Smith team. This New York defense is not good. And we've seen the bears, uh, pretty, pretty bad against the running, running game as well. So as Ant said, you know, if Saquon's in beast mode, you've got two guys who are, are coming off some, you know, pretty hot performances and two defenses who have not looked like they're going to know how to stop either guy. So it's interesting, but I think both teams, you know, that they're, I think they're going to put on some points, just not in an exciting way. It's not going to be an aerial attack where we see. Yeah, I, I agree uh, completely. And my bold prediction, I think this is going to be another week for the defense to where there's going to be some massive plays um, I don't know how they're going to do against Saquon. If they're able to stop Saquon, this is for me, it's a relatively easy game for the Bears to win because on offense, they literally don't have anything else because of injuries and the passing attack just isn't there. Um, I, the Cowboys were there for the Giants to beat and the Giants beat themselves in not beating the Dallas Cowboys because they're making so many mistakes. Um, so with that, I think, and I know... Eddie Jackson has gotten all the plaudits. You've seen Roquan Smith getting all the plaudits. But I think Jaquan Brisker gets a pick t- pick six in this game. I think he's going to be one of those that's going to be up at the line of scrimmage trying to confuse Daniel Jones, and I think he makes a mistake. I was in between that or getting Dominique Robinson to get more than one sack in this game. I think the defense needs to be aggressive. If they're aggressive, I think they can win. I think there's going to be a couple of turnovers for the Bears. There is every single week. But with Daniel Jones, I think the Bears have a good shot of being able to turn the ball over and putting this offense in good field position. Um, And with that, I have the Bears winning 27-13. Again, I don't believe in this Giants attack. I believe if you can stop Saquon Barkley, you can stop the Giants offense. Their offensive line has not played well. It's not a bad offensive line, but they've not been able to protect Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones has made some poor decisions. And really, if it wasn't for Saquon Barkley, they would look pitiful in terms of the first couple of weeks of the season, but he's kind of saved them at different points. So like I said, a key emphasis for the Bears is stop Saquon. If you can stop Saquon, you have a really good chance to win this football game, especially if you can get your passing game going even just a little bit this week um but yeah that's where i have it right now um it's probably one of the the games over the next couple weeks that i am pretty sure in that the bears are going in as a little bit of favorites i know they're kind of away from home but i think this is an important game for the bears to win if you go off three and one you give yourself a little bit of kind of a game where if you play like crap and lose it doesn't really matter because you're still in a decent situation but that's where I have it right now. Um, but yeah, look, I think it's going to be a really interesting game. I do think it's going to be a competitive game. 
but I think defensive scores for the Bears will happen this week. And I think that's what's going to be the difference between the Bears winning. So that's why I have them as 27-13 winners. And again, last year with relatively similar teams, the Bears won 29-3. So it's not out of the realms of possibility. So like I said, you stop Saquon and for me, then you stop the Giants. So that's where I'm at at the moment. We have one other person in the chat has said Bears 26, uh, (laughs) Giants 18. Um, so yeah, look, I think it's going to be an interesting game. I can't wait for it. I'm, I'm like you, Anthony, from what you said on the show. I just want to see my team win. I'm like, if Fields plays like crap, he plays like crap. If the Bears win, I'll still be happy after the game. And that's just the way it's going to be. And look, guys, we mentioned it earlier on in the show. All of us are going to be in Chicago during week six for the Washington Commanders game. Make sure you let us know if you're going to the game. Let us know. We're going to be trying to meet as as many people as possible. We'll be going around kind of at different tailgates and stuff like that. We'll be talking to different Bears fans. And there's going to be kind of a an interesting video that's going to be going up for that week. We will probably do a podcast before we leave to go to Chicago. Now, Ant will be in Chicago at that stage, but a couple of us will still be here. So we will get one of those out to you guys before we head over. But then there is going to be an interesting video that goes out that week a little bit of a vlog so if you want to be involved and you see us make sure you come over we'll ask you a couple of questions get as many people involved as possible because we want to get as many bears fans involved in those types of videos as as we possibly can because this channel is for you guys as well so with that being said make sure that you like the video make sure you subscribe follow us over on twitter follow all these guys over on twitter if you like listening on audio and you're listening on apple Podcasts please give us a five-star review. It really helps with all the analytics and stuff like that and gets people to listen to the show. Same thing, like the video, comment your thoughts on the video and comment your thoughts on the bears. Again, it helps more people see the see the, the show and these videos. We have a bunch coming out. There's going to be a couple of videos coming in if you are into college football or the draft. Those are going to be starting up um, to where you just a couple of analysis videos, some reviews of the first couple weeks of the college football season so if you like that that's going to be starting from the end of this week and then obviously we will be here on sunday we will be here pre-game and post-game so make sure that you do join us for then and look guys until then thank you for joining us all we can say is bear bear down